lot of times in that country uh, or in a war zone like that, you'll get a you'll get a walk in. Somebody volunteering. Someone who volunteers. Hey, Taliban, Al Qaeda. I have access to them. You know, yada yada yada. Here's here's how. Most of them are just trying to peddle information for money. You'll have traditional mill at the base who kind of vets them, make sure, hey, this guy's not strapped with an IED. He's not gonna just clack off and kill people. They're in a lot of danger. You know, yeah. the, the, some of the people they hate more than anyone over there is, is the people who work with Americans, not just Americans. So then you start to do some clandestine meetings. You, you know, you'll set up locations. You'll then you'll get a little bit more mousy and you know work on trade craft and, and do clandestine pickups and go meet in secure places, which sometimes is back at the base. But you'll how you get them there is is clandestine. You want to uh, uh, assuming you have, and even if you don't assume that you do have a tail, protect that source because you got to protect them. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. Over a 15-year period, he spent time at the NSA, the DIA, and the CIA. Is there any other three-letter alphabet soup <laughs> fucking organizations you were with? That Those are the only ones I could get in there. Yeah. yeah. He was a counterterrorism officer. Uh, he's currently the host of This Is My Show with Drew Berquist. He's also currently housing his Afghan interpreter, which we're going to get into. He's the original war dog, not the curly-headed fat fuck one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Drew Berquist. Hey, man, it's great to be here. Thanks for coming. We have a mutual friend. I'm not going to mention his name yet because trying to get him to come on the show uh and i'm not sure if he can yet or not so uh thank you to you know who you are and uh hopefully we can get his ass in here too but uh what is the dumbest thing about the cia other than itself <laughs> how much time we got oh man um the, the the leadership and the culture there is awful and it's it's tricky too because you know i get being in conservative media, you get all these people with all these ideas that come in now and they think they know everything. And of course they can't from, from an outsider's perspective. If you haven't worked in the community, you haven't worked specifically in that building and that culture. Um, but everyone thinks they understand the agency and they, and they don't. And frankly, I don't know that, you know, as much time as myself and a lot of our mutual friends and colleagues have spent time working with them. I don't know that I completely do either. Um, but it is, it is a, bloated like most government agencies it is a bloated organization with way too many bodies uh that just clouds the mission and makes things complicated for the people who actually are out doing the job which is which is like i think anywhere you know whether you're talking about a three-letter agency whether you're talking about the military i mean the percentage of people who are actually doing the real stuff that everyone imagines in their mind is yeah. so it's such a small yeah. number like, it's, it's like the uh, the brochure of anything you know, being that percentage of the actual job that you do, like pick a recruiting brochure, we'll take the SEAL teams, like what it shows in that brochure is about 3% of the fucking job. You know, the rest of right. it is sweeping f floors and loading pallets and fucking, you know, cleaning shit and, you know, it's sitting in the fucking mud. Right. Uh, it, it, to pinpoint, like, could you pinpoint one single thing that like this is the dumbest part of, of the CIA to reduce it to one, one thing? I, 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 that's a tough question. I mean, I think there's too many. There's too many. I think the thing that that is the dumbest thing that hurts the mission and the culture the most is, and again, this is something that happens at any of these organizations in in D.C. in the greater area there, and and just our kind of government hierarchy, as you will. But like, is how people grow kind of the careerist there the the people who climb the ladders and get to make decisions yeah. are people who have never done the, the actual job yeah you know so it's do, like everywhere else it's then. like everywhere else yeah. it's like hold on you're telling me what to do you just got off the plane five minutes ago yeah you've never been here we've yeah. been here you know i've deployed you know deployed the afghanistan over 30 times like you're going to come in and tell us how this needs to be done. Yeah. Which, you know, to me, the frustrating thing, because obviously it's the same way in the military and, and in a lot of, like, like I said, everywhere 
if you're at McDonald's, that means like maybe your burger's uncooked or some shit's not that efficient, you know, but in that line of work, like people get, get killed or blown up or kidnapped or, right. you know, whatever. So, uh, man, that's frustrating. Uh, I'm going to take a, a quick break. I, I do want to let you guys know, um, the way that you can support the show is to support our sponsors. Uh, I know some people don't like to hear ads, but, uh, that's how I do what I do for a living. So, uh, any support you can show for our gracious sponsors is much appreciated. And again, it does uh, does support the show. So thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Um, not surprising. I, I've known enough guys uh, that have been there, but, um, what is your favorite childhood memory? Oh man, everything. My childhood, I was really blessed, really fortunate, grew up in Minnesota, um, which is just a, a you know, great, you, you're playing in snow. You have no responsibility. You never have to shovel the snow, by the way, you know, dad does that. Um, <laughs> So you just get all the fun. And, and, you know, I grew up in a football family, my brothers, two older brothers who treated me like I was, you know, one of them got to hang out with their friends. We'd play football. It'd be me versus the two of them, which doesn't seem very fair, but I think it was good for me in the long run. And we had a, we had this basement <clears throat> that had like a, it's not as high tech as maybe it sounds, but we had like a little indoor basketball hoop. We had a, a football field, like a big run in this, this area taped off with, um, masking tape we had taped like a field goal post on the closet which the doors fell off all the time we had a pool table and a, you know just everything down there. it was like a boy's dream so we'd have we'd, we'd play sports down there everyone in the neighborhood would come over you know we'd watch movies down there there'd be bb gun fights down there you name it like it, it sounds like the uh if you were to encapsulate the epitome of an 80s midwest upbringing that like that's it yeah you know? and, and it's something yeah. you don't see anymore like my yeah. kids would never understand no, I hear you. Our, our, you know, our street and how yeah. that worked. I, I'm right there with you. I mean, I'm from Iowa and, and same kind of thing. Like, you know, there's a handful of uh, basements that were just like that, yeah. you know, in, in my childhood, which I miss. I, I talk about that or think about it a lot, you know, the, the kind of travesty. Now, granted, you, you don't know what you don't know. You know, ignorance is bliss. Like kids nowadays don't, don't know what they're missing. But um, to think of like the childhood childhoods that we had at that time, especially in, in that part of the country. And I think just the country as a whole, like growing up as a kid in the seventies, eighties, early nineties, um, you know, I, I don't think you can beat it, but no. um, of course my dad says the same thing. He's like, I felt bad for you poor bastards because of the shit that you didn't get to do that I got to do as a kid. Like the shit he was doing when he was right. growing up, like riding fucking motorcycles off roofs and, you know, being left <laughs> alone for a summer yeah you know, like no you're right i mean it is ignorance yeah. is bliss but i mean i mean think of the change now like people don't really collectively let their kids out. i mean no, for us crazy. it was you know it, it, people are shocked that we would drink out of garden hoses for yeah. pete's sakes but you'd let kids like yeah just go do whatever like when the street lights come on come home yeah i mean like, when i was in second grade like i, I rode my bike fucking everywhere yeah. you know like as a what is that seven year old six seven years old like i, I would ride miles away from my house <laughs> by myself yeah uh, and I would meet a buddy of mine that like we would meet halfway between my house and his house and we'd ride around for two hours before we would go back to, to one of our houses or whatever. And it's like, I, I can't even imagine letting kids at that age, I mean, not even really at fucking like 12, 13, you know, you're, you're hesitant to let your kids do shit like that nowadays. It's wild. Totally. Uh, what's the last book, the full book that you actually read and finished? The last full book, man, I, I, got my hands in so many companies and initiatives right now i'll start one and and then not finish it um i read because i was curious about it um this sounds interesting the book by um no it was it was i'm always just curious on other people's perspectives on yeah. kind of the different stuff that we did and it was um i think his name's nolan peterson and it was why soldiers miss war oh really something like that um <clears throat> you know he, he hadn't served it was a it was a, a, a journalist who had been embedded over there and served and kind of had this this viewpoint and he you know he went into a bunch of other stuff too but the main thing that drew me I was like okay I'm cu I'm curious let, let me see if you get this right yeah. if 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 you kind of get the the mindset of people who have spent so much time overseas so that was you know it was pretty good yeah. it was pretty good I don't know much about him I don't know 
but but someone had had shown it to me. I was like, all right, I'll ch- I'll check it out. Yeah, uh, that sounds that sounds interesting. Um, what is your morning routine uh, on a on a normal day when you're in town? Say the first three hours. Get up. What time? You uh, depends on the day. So I, I I but but typically like you know seven to eight range. Yeah. Um, not like a five thirty six a.m. riser. I probably should be uh, with as much going on, but I'm usually so tanked by the end of the night. That's like, all right, I got to just get some. So, so I get up, got to get that coffee, Life Butter Champions in, in your system, um, copious amounts. And I start kind of just going through, okay, what's going on in the world? What, what, what stories are out there? What are we going to talk about today? Um, <clears throat> what's, what's some stuff that we, we have to hit on that's serious? What's some stuff that's maybe more lighthearted? You know, um, what's our, we have a random ass question of the day every day we start the show with. And sometimes it, 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 it's, yeah, a lot of '80s lure in there. Like, yeah. I mean, we'll talk about stuff. so, but like, you know, what's that going to be? Just kind of start things off, and I just kind of start building that stuff, and then communicating with my team, who is mostly remote now, <clears throat> not because of COVID, just because of life circumstances and whatnot. So we'll start sending that out, getting assets queued up, and really kind of building the show. Take my uh, my one, my oldest son, uh, my only son, but my oldest kid is homeschooled now, just because. Um, of a, of a lot of reasons, but uh, he's in a great situation. So I'll take him, drop him off. Um, it's really, the morning is just kind of show prep. It's, it's, it's getting that set. So then I can, you know, pass that off to the production team, move on to other stuff that, that I'm doing work wise, you know, get, if there's any meetings, you know, get that stuff in there. Um, because the day is, it's a frantic race from the very yeah. get go. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it sounds uh, hectic. Um, <clears throat> From a, a show standpoint, is, is that typically what you hit on? I mean, we'll get into into the kind of the gist of it, but is, is there a mission statement or a 30-second elevator pitch that you have for the show? I, I would say it's just kind of looking at things, and obviously this is what anyone can say their own views are common sense or practical, but it's looking at news stories through a practical, quasi-entertaining, not super serious way, talking about them, talking about the impacts that it has on – everyday Americans. Um, and even though I'm a conservative, um, which is one of the reasons we get a lot of problems on big tech is it's really a, a pro America show. Like yeah. here's look, it's not about a party. It's not about a candidate. It's about America's awesome. I fought for this country. You fought for this country. Let's keep this thing going because it's pretty damn awesome. Yeah. And that's kind of the mindset of the show. And, and, um, that's more than 30 seconds. Yeah. But. No, it's good. I, I, uh, I mean, that, that paints a good picture for sure. Uh, so you're originally from Minnesota. Um, I, I got a pretty good synopsis of how, how your childhood was, but uh, if, if you could just kind of synopsize from the time that you remember and, and you know, up go- growing through high school, what was that like? Yeah, so again, it was childhood was awesome. I, my father worked at the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, which is which is why we were there and why eventually we came down to Jacksonville. But growing up in Minnesota, like you said, the Midwest people are amazing just your childhood up there, the things you get to experience. We're a big football family. We're still Viking season ticket holders. None of us live in Minnesota anymore. But you a big Kirk Cousins fan then? I'm not a huge Kirk Cousins right? fan. He uh, seems to be doing a good job. He's though. doing a good job. I think he's an awesome guy. Yeah. Um, good kisser. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean. Soft I, hands. Very soft hands. He's a, He's got a gentle touch. Um, great cuddler. But, but he, you know, he, he, he does – when he has time, he can throw some dimes. The dude, yeah. the dude can throw the football – when there's pressure, which you can say for a lot of people, he he tends to just cower, and you see the deer in the headlight look like, yeah. no, 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 don't do that. Like yeah. let's let's go off schedule here and, and try and make a play. <clears throat> yeah, but no, it was great. It was a great upbringing. I loved it, and and then played eventually sp- played football. Played football. Um, all, all three of my brothers and I played college football to some extent. Some with more success than others. Uh, so we came down to Florida. My middle brother and I played at a, at a very successful uh, private school down there. Got great opportunities. Got to to win lots of football games in high school, which was which is awesome. Played for a legendary coach who's the winningest coach in Florida history. Uh, maybe maybe the biggest influence in my life. Just an awesome guy. A lot of a lot of people who who are playing in the league would say the same thing. But uh, Corky Rogers was was a legend. Um, so did that. Got an opportunity to to play. At Michigan, I would say that I was more of a never was than even a has been because during training camp, I fractured a vertebrae and slipped a disc in my back. So oh, wow. um, I was pretty much done before it started. Um, but at Michigan, though. But at Michigan. So that was that was awesome. You know, got to have 
you know, my name in the locker room, my name on a jersey, and, and hold the winged helmet there for a little bit and practice. And um, it didn't last long. The team doc, it's a long story, but the team doc was a total douchebag. He got let go the next year. A lot of these guys at these big schools, and I, I don't know this for certain about him, but with big schools like Michigan where there's lots of money involved, NFL teams, these docs will actually pay to, to, to be into that position, right? Because you get lots of notoriety. Oh, there's doc, whoever, running out into the field. And – he was like, look, you're, <clears throat> you're, we're not going to clear. You cannot play Big Ten football with that injury. You're going to get paralyzed. Like, well, let me fly home, go to Mayo Clinic. My dad's, we had been at that point, we we're down in Jacksonville, Florida. Let's get it looked at there. So we go, I go home, get it checked out. <clears throat> They're like, yeah, no, it's definitely broken. But, um, you know, either with surgery or, or a year of rest, it should be, it'll be fine. Um, so we go back up there, talk to Coach Carr, who was there at the time, and he was on our side, like, hey, here's what they're saying. Here's what the Mayo Clinic's saying. But, of course, you have two docs now saying, I think you're wrong. So you get ego involved. Yeah. And he was like, nope, we're not going to do it. We're like, all right, we'll sign a thing saying if we get paralyzed, it's not your fault because we believe, you yeah. know, what Mayo is saying, and this is a good opportunity, yada, yada. Anyways, long story short, the doc wouldn't clear me. I ended up leaving to try and go play somewhere else. It didn't end up happening um, or didn't end up working. Um, 9-11 happened, and I, I just got on my horse to like, all right, if I can't do this, I mean, I'm at the time, not now. Yeah. At the time, I mean, I'm in great shape. I can, I can do a lot of things. Um, you know, let's go. So I got focused on school. I got focused on, you know, kind of getting things in order because I'd, I'd let a lot of things slip with football. Yeah. You get this mindset of like, oh, you're a great football player. You know, you, you can do whatever you want. Like, your focus is on the game and not everything else, and I'd let stuff slide. So kind of got refocused at that time. Yeah. Before we get into all the, uh, you know, graduating and moving into uh, NSA, DIA, CIA, one thing I, I'm, I've just always been kind of curious about is from an athleticism standpoint, and I promise I'll keep this short for all of you with your panties in a twist wanting to hear the CIA stories, but, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a Big Ten Division One, you know, one of the kind of most prolific uh, football programs in, in existence or in the history of this country like the level of athleticism of of the players that are there compared to, you know, other guys that you've worked with, you know, some tier one special operations guy, like w would you consider them even close to the same level or are the guys who are varsity starting football players just on a whole different fucking level? Like like <laughs> caliber of fucking dude if, if you're squared off against them t type of thing. Well, I think um – Yes and no. I, 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 there, there's definitely comparisons. You know, the, 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 obviously the locker room team component of things is very similar to what you experience in, in both realms. Um, there's some dudes who are just, I feel like in, in the, in, albeit different communities, you know, that we served in, um, lots of crossover. I feel like there's a lot of people there who are fit, great athletes, this, that, and the other, but they just are hard workers. They're just team players. Whereas with, with, you know, major division one football, you've got some guys who fit that category. It's like, Oh, you could go and I would pick you to be on my team or lead my team in anything and everything that we do. And then there's some people who are like, you're one of the best athletes I've ever seen in my life, but you're an idiot. And, and you're fucking lazy and you're lazy. And you you just have kind of, you know, skated through here. And that's not the case for some, but there's, I mean, uh, there's, I remember there was a big, you know, some of the DBs, like you get to that level and you see the DBs and their footwork and you're just like, holy shit. Like these, these people move differently than anyone else yeah. I've seen. And, and I, you know, I was fortunate. I was all state in Florida. I, I was a decent football player. What a position? I played linebacker. Yeah. So you get, but you get to there and you're like, wow. And Anthony Thomas is in the backfield running at you in practice. And you're like, oh, okay, this is, this is different. Like yeah. he's not small. Um, but but there's a lot of them. There's there's big line. There's a lineman who came in that year, and I, I wouldn't say his name. I don't remember it anyways. But you know, you're playing offensive line at a Big Ten school that's you know a run focused kind of pro style offense. The dude had been so lazy. Part of it's on his high school coach and his family and everyone in his community and whatnot. He couldn't bench one rep of two twenty five. Like he hadn't he hadn't worked hard at all. And it's you know, there's people like that. There's 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 other folks who are like, ah, I'm not taking care of the school. I'm not I'm gonna just, you know, skate by. It's like that, you're killing me. Like you could you could go and play in the NFL if you stay healthy. Yeah. But you're just just don't give it. You just you just don't yeah. So it's so I think there that's where the difference is. Whereas 
on our side, you have to give a fuck. And if, and if you don't, you're not there and yeah. no one's going to want to be around you. But I think, you know, even to say giving a fuck, like short strokes it a little bit, like the, the level of, of dedication, commitment and drive that you have to have at that level, you know, on, on the military or government side is, is obsessive compulsive. Like it's all, yeah. it's like there's something wrong with you. hundred percent, you know, um, which I think is a, is a stark contrast, but all right. So you, you end up, where did you end up graduating from? So I ended up graduating from university of North Florida in Jacksonville. In what, in what? In Jacksonville? No, I mean, uh, Oh, in oh, uh, international studies. So I went, I ended up, you know, kind of making my own degree. And I was really fortunate, had some people who were like department chairs who kind of let me build my own thing. I went out to Monterey because I knew I wanted to, to go and serve. And I wasn't sure at the time if it was going to be mill or government agency or law enforcement or what it was going to be. But I knew I wanted to do something in that vein. And I had a lot to, so I thought to give. Um, so I went out to Monterey, did intensive Arabic, trying to just, you know, put myself, you know, in a different category, try and get my resume, you know, into a different different stack and got to do some study abroad stuff, got to do all sorts of stuff. Now, granted, I didn't do anything to do with the Middle East. I went to Prague, which was badass. It's an awesome city. You so, you sorry bastard. I know. It was, God damn. Yeah, it, I love that city, man. Oh, it's, it's if, if people in the audience have not been to Prague, it's got to be on your bucket list. It's just awesome. But <clears throat> excuse me. But no, so I, I, I did that and, and graduated from there, international studies, political science, um, minor but i don't i don't remember a course that i did in that like it wasn't yeah. you know i got to do like i had one class where i just was i wrote a paper i don't remember what was on but all i had to do was just write the paper and turn it in i mean they were really cool to me and i was able to kind of get my shit together and and come out with a decent gpa and a decent kind of resume that and, and application that maybe would get some people's attention and thankfully thankfully it did and how does that process work for you know for the listener like you're in college, you, you do, you know, you're getting to the point where you're, you're ready to graduate, whether or not your uh, classes and, and degree are focused or centered or geared towards that line of work or not. Like what, how does it work uh, to, to get into that world? Well, you got to, st- I mean, <clears throat> first of all, well, there's, there's two things and these kind of c- contradict each other, I think, but you know, as we all know in life, none of these degrees really set you up perfectly for what you, unless you're, you know, going to be a lawyer, uh, which we've got to talk about that because there aren't many good ones. Um, but lawyers, doctors, something like that is very niche. Um, or you're going to get your PhD and be a, a, a professor or something like that. But for the most part, it doesn't really matter. Um, as long as you bust your ass and show up every day and, and get better every day and are a good, you know, colleague or teammate or whatever your, your situation might be. But I think if in the case of being more proactive, which does, which does help, you know, I, I think you get ahead and say, hey, I want to do this. And like I did, not to say that I did everything perfect, but like, all right, what are they looking for? You know, that anyone can graduate with international studies or political science or whatever your career path might look like. But for, in the case of this, those are kind of the, the general, general things, right? So what differentiates you you know, Joe from Johnny, you both have international studies degrees. Maybe one's got a better GPA, but like, whatever, like that doesn't really, I mean, some places that matters more than it should, but so finding, finding what they want, you know, and I knew at the time, Hey, they they want some hard language skills. They want people who can speak Chinese. Well, I don't want to learn that shit. And the war is happening right now in South Asia and the Middle East. So I'm going to learn Arabic. Um, So, you know, trying to find some things like that and getting ahead because man, the process is, it is long and there's lots of quiet parts of the process where you hear nothing, which is, you know, hindsight is that's what you want to hear. You know, silence is golden. It's, it's, it's a good sign if you're not hearing anything um, because they'll, they'll shut you down pretty quick otherwise. So it's, it's, it's a long journey. It takes a long ass time to get, to get through. So start early. I mean, I, like I, I started applying. um, I, I guess it was about the beginning of my last year in school. Um, which I did more years in school. I kind of went like the Tommy boy, um, <laughs> Tommy boy route. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of people that go to college for seven years. They're called doctors. <laughs> what, I missed uh, that guy. But I mean, so I mean, even just the the application process. I mean, it, it, forgive my fucking ignorance on it. As many guys as I know, I've never asked this question. 
Is it as simple as you go to the fucking website and, or, I mean, how, how does it actually yeah. work? Yeah. You, um, <clears throat> go to the website, you know, you pick and it's, it's tricky too, because of course you don't know everything about how the different, you know, sp speaking specifically to CIA, for example, which is, you know, I applied to all of them. I was given great wisdom by a guy who was a former, um, you know, soft operator who was actually out of the language school that I was with, um, and he was like, man, just get your ticket. And then he'd gotten out and worked for one of the three-letter agencies. He's like, get your tickets wherever you can get them. Because only a few places will give you the TSSCI, you know, all the way to the top. So I applied to all those places. You go online. Anyways, getting back to, as I banged the mic, getting back to, it's, it's tricky because there's all these different directorates, right? And you don't know exactly what they do. You have an idea of what they do. But again, it's kind of like we were talking about earlier only a few people get to do the really cool stuff and that stuff is usually not labeled it's it's under an umbrella category but so you 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 kind of guess and you and you you th I think I want to do this I think it's in this vein you choose that path you apply online you know, then, off the top of your head do you know what the different veins are what the different kind of categories are so if you're if you're looking at the agency for example you've got like the director of science and technology you know, you're smart guys. And there's people who do operational stuff in there too, but a lot of smart guys. You've got the clandestine service, which is what most people are going to think of, you know, because they're... James Bond. Yeah, I want to go be Jason Bourne or James Bond or whoever. And so they, they do that. And that, that includes both the, the paramil paramilitary guys, you know, um, as well as your more traditional cat and mouse uh, espionage guys. <laughs> and then you've got your analysts. So, you know, there's a bunch of different paths. And those, those, those things are pretty clear. Like some people know, I, I met with a kid a couple weeks ago who was interested. I met with two, actually. And one was very clearly, you know, the eye test, but also just talking to him. He was, he was an analyst. Like he was someone who was going to be, and I'm sure he'll be great at it. I could never be an analyst. Yeah. Um, you certainly don't want me to be an analyst. The other kid was wired different. It's like, well, you probably want to go this way. You probably want to go this way. Once you're in, there's always the opportunity to, to make some adjustments and change. and Lateral transfer. Yeah. yeah, so it's the, the main thing is, is I think getting in, you know, and it's, it's I can't speak to your process. Like it's, you know, it's, it's maybe better if you're hell-bent on, on going SF to do an 18X contract and not go in and be infantry and then try and come over or to do, you know, I know there's the SEAL Challenge contract. I don't know if they still do that. But like, Yeah, I mean, it, it's a little different. I mean, for us, it's a little more, I guess, cut and dry slash set in stone and that you kind of have to pick, or at least you did. Maybe it's different now. But, like, if you were going to be a corpsman, you, you had to kind of identify that. Everything else, um, you know, it's kind of an in-house thing. The, the corpsman is the one thing that, uh, again, to my knowledge, I think you have to pick right away, and, and that's a very different path. It's a longer path, you know. Like you'll graduate buds, and then you go to to core school, so you're you're going to be way behind. Like your classmates, in most instances, like have deployed by the time you show up at a fucking team if you go through the 18 Delta Long course or whatever. But but that's really it. Everything else, you know, whether it's sniper, or, you know, breacher, or any of the other schools, those are all kind of. Once you show up, you can, you can go do all of those things, uh, but it's going to be dependent on what platoon you're in, how good of a job you've done, what slots are available, timing. You know, there's a lot of other factors that don't have anything to do with with you really what, as to whether or not you get to go. But uh, I think that there there's less ability to kind of move around. You know, for for example, like you couldn't go through buds, make it to a SEAL team, and then be like, you know what, actually, I want to try the Green Berets for a little while. Oh, right, you, right. You know, like, <laughs> for the most part. Now, having said that, with the exception of the Tier 1 guys, especially on, on the green side, like, anybody from any armed service branch of, you know, I mean, the fucking Coast Guard can can try out for it, you know. So, uh, whereas, you know, Tier 1 on the on the Navy side is uh, you have to have been a SEAL, and right. there's no uh, no wiggle room there. But uh, anyway, not to not to railroad the combo. But so... Um, it's a, a super long process. No news is good news. From the time you kind of said, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm, I'm kicking out my applications, putting the feelers out until you actually were hired on, what was the length of time? I think it was, you know, they'll tell you to prepare for upwards of two years. I think mine was about a year and a half, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, and, and the, the last part, once you get, once you finally get picked, like, okay, yeah, we want to hire you. Um, you know, then you move into the background and, and all of that. And the background investigation is, is the longest part. Um, it probably shouldn't be, but again, the government's bloated and, and the way they do things is, is not always the best. So, 
So that takes a long time. And, and uh, by the time they get that done, it ends up being, you know, well over a year, sometimes upwards uh, of two. So, um, yeah, but it, 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 and, and I didn't, when I went to NSA, I did not want to go there because most of the people there, if you, if you've ever been to NSA, you, you know, you see like, was the Will Smith enemy of state? And you're like, ah, oh, maybe they do some cool stuff. Uh, and they do. There's some people who do some badass stuff there. And there's some people who go on and work with another, you know, tier one unit there um, that, that does some awesome stuff. But most of the jobs, again, like anywhere else, are just you've got scientists, you've got linguists, you've got this, that and the other. And and I knew that wasn't my home, but they had this new program. They're like, hey, and I, don't, um, I forget what it's called, but it was a language program. Like, hey, we're taking people who specifically have a starting kind of just foundation of either Chinese, Arabic, Farsi, one of those, those harder to learn languages. And we're going to pay you and train you. DOD is going to pay you and train you for the benefit of <coughs> DOD. So they came through first and, and that guy had said, yeah, they'd take your tickets. So I was like, all right, well, I'll have the highest clearance I can get, you know, outside of, you know, compartmented programs and I'll take it. So I went and just learned more Arabic, just got paid to study for a while, which, which sucks for me because I'm not really a student. So I'm, you know, putting on adult clothes, which I hate, and going and learning. Um, but I knew it would, would pay off, and it, and it did pretty quick. Yeah. That year and a half between when you applied until you actually got picked up, what were you doing for work or to make a living at that point? <clears throat> Odds and ends. I still um, I still was home. My parents were, were supportive. Um, and you're how old at this point? Oh, I don't know, 21, 22, yeah. thereabouts. I... Um, there's a lot there that was blurred. My parents actually were going through a divorce at that time too. So lots of stuff, lots of stuff going on in life. Yeah. And you know, it's one of those pockets where it's like, I don't remember everything. Yeah. I remember the, the highlights. Lots of drugs. No, I got it. Exactly. Uh, uh, as you guys know, uh, health and fitness is a big part of my daily routine and my lifestyle. I have a number of guests that come on that, uh, you know, that we talk about all, all sorts of things, health and fitness related, uh, diet, nutrition, et cetera. Uh, I started taking athletic greens uh, a few months ago here uh, for that reason is that it's a uh, all all encompassing vitamin and mineral supplement, 75 vitamins and minerals. Uh, it's lifestyle friendly, whether you do keto, paleo, vegan, it's dairy free, gluten free, uh, less than one gram of sugar. There's no uh, GMOs or nasty chemicals. There's no artificial anything in it. Uh, and it's just very nutrient dense and uh, and gives you that that supplementation that you need to combat cold and flu season coming up to bolster your immune system uh, and just help with a, with a healthy lifestyle. Um, right now, the, the subscription, if you sign up for it, comes with a year's supply of vitamin D, which again uh, is, is crucial to uh, immune support, as well as five uh, on-the-go packets uh, with that first purchase. Um, whether you want to invest in, in your health or just supplement an, an already existing protocol that you have, uh, athletic greens has been a, a phenomenal staple, uh, that I've added into my regimen and I couldn't be happier to be working with them. Uh, if you want in on that deal, go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mic drop. Um, and they, they do a phenomenal job at, uh, all the things that, uh, health and fitness, um, wise need to be done on a daily basis. So check them out. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mic drop, and they will hook you up with that uh, special deal. All right, so uh, so you're at you get picked up by the NSA, um, you go learn Arabic there. Uh, walk us through kind of the path, uh, you know, from from when you uh, learned Arabic and, and subsequently after that. Yeah, so um, started there at, at just a school in house at the at, at Fort Meade. Um, again, showed up, drank coffee, went through Arabic. Very formal training. It wasn't very functional training. The first training we got was like, this is bullshit. Like we're we're going through this, you know, these thick ass textbooks, which I get makes sense. Um, you got, you got to have that foundation. You've got to understand things, but I'd, I'd done a lot of that and it was frustrating. Eventually they moved us to the state part, uh, state department's foreign service Institute, you know, where they just teach languages for a living. And I, I am not a big fan of state department, but the school is, is awesome. They like, they, it is legit. So you go to this special campus and you just learn, language throughout the day and that's very conversational so and don't ask me by the way to speak Arabic because I, I hardly speak English now because uh, I haven't used it but um, so I go there we're, we're doing that 
And at the time, while we're at Foreign Service Institute, you know, still just learning, commuting on the frickin' train to a bus, too, is an awful thing, too, because I was up in Baltimore. This is way down, you know, in Virginia. Rumsfeld, who at the time was SecDef, started, started kind of tweaking. It, it wasn't a new program. It started tweaking an existing program and came up with a new concept for kind of blending Intel and soft. Because at the time, you know, the folks at, at, at Blue and Green didn't have, they weren't their own like agencies like they are now, essentially. Um, so they leaned on, on other folks to, to kind of come in and supplement. So they were working on this because you had a bunch of dudes who would be older guys who were more traditional case officer types, which I never was, um, who would attach to a SEAL team, for example. And if they were ever on objective with them, they were a liability, yeah. you know, because, you know, from a training perspective, one, but from a, they're just old and out of shape. It's like this guy, you know, was, was fighting the cold war, you know, passing notes and smoking cigarettes with people. And now you're dumping them into Afghanistan or Iraq and it's just not the right fit. So they, they changed that. I'm like, Hey, we're starting this program. And I still don't really, <clears throat> so I, I applied to go over there to DIA and got the job because I had the tickets and had Arabic, which helped. And they put me in this pipeline for traditional kind of Intel training, you know, to be a human collector, whether it was, you know, we did debriefing, we did interrogation, you know, asset meetings and this, that, and the other. And some people would go on from there and train at the farm and go the full case officer route. That was just never my style because those guys just, it's very different than what people think it is. How, uh, how so? Like what, what's the most surprising or thing that's different than most people would think? You know, some of them will get good training I mean, a lot of these agencies give awesome training, but case officers, and I've, I've met a couple that I like, but they tend to be prima donnas. These are the types who the agency hire, they hire all the wrong people for that job, typically. You know, they hire people who graduated from an Ivy League school, whose, you know, grandfather was a senator. You know, like they just hire these people who's like, yeah, but they're not good socially. You know, they're not the type of people who are going to really successfully convince someone to spy on their country, go into harm's way, put their life in danger. So you've got these people who are, have had a lot of things handed to them. And again, not all, I, I'm not trying to speak in absolutes. There's some amazing ones. There's some people who were prior mill or uh, mill who do it and, and are awesome at it, but you've got the wrong ones. And then, you know, you see the movies out there, like so many people in America and around the globe do. And you think, Oh, this is going to be badass. It's like, and of course it's never like the movies or at least the vast, vast majority of the time it's not. And for the most part, those guys are sitting in a coffee shop, taking notes and giving them some money for some information, which can lead to some badass stuff. But that part there is really just not, it's not that sexy. Yeah. Like, I mean, to me, like if, if, if I was in charge of that, that unit and I was trying to find people to, to do that job, like I would go to bars and find ugly guys who are good at getting laid. <laughs> there, yeah, exactly. I mean, really, like, like you're 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 spinning some. You're you're telling a tale that's working. Yeah, and right. I don't get it, which means you're perfect yeah, for I this. Mean, yeah, that, to me, like that. That's the essence of that job. Yeah, you know. But um, all right, so I guess mo moving forward in in that path. So then, then what after that? So I get I get to DIA. Um, I get I I get kind of my initial training, and you know, just EOD, EOD stuff, all the just the basic stuff. You know, signing stuff and and getting ready and i got connected with this guy um last name church um i'll leave it there but he um he was an older gentleman really nice guy and he was one of the dudes who was involved in this new effort from the dia standpoint and i just kind of got in his hip pocket i met him through one of the training things i met him through um I, th I think they actually did like an information session on, hey, we're starting this new thing. You know, you've got to fit these categories to do it. You've got to be able to pass all these PT and swim tests and, and do a lot more physical stuff than traditional intel officers are required to do. You've got to have a language. You've got to be willing to go through all this stuff. And I'm like, me, uh, that's me. That's, like, I, I kind of wanted to go the mill route in the first place and maybe should have, but I, I want to do this. Um, I don't want to just be smoking cigarettes with people and, and writing down notes. Um, so I got in this guy's ear and I really probably didn't, you know, outside of being in shape and having some language, I probably didn't belong there because I hadn't gotten much training yet, but he, he supported me. He put me in the pipeline. I got to do it. Um, 
we had uh, a great former um, colonel from Green um, who came over and was running our unit, um, who was a really, really good guy, um, really helpful, kind of a, a good mentor. And we, so basically we then would, you know, it's essentially the hat teams, but we, we, we were under a new name, which I won't say because I think they still have it. But um, What does hat stand for? Uh, human augmentation teams. So you'd have the wrong people deploying uh, before, and then now these started, and you had kind of the, you know, Omega teams that started back then where you'd have tier one elements, either blue or green, and you'd have us come in as their intel guys and and they had better training not not the same training you know these aren't guys who went through buds but they went through enough to be like okay these guys we're not going to hurt you yeah um and for, and for the listener just i know i i was guilty of this earlier blue uh referring to navy green referring to army i know uh, sometimes we gloss over some of those things and want to keep everybody lost but anyway yeah so that and and depending on which team you were with internal to DIA, you would attach to, you know, either a green unit or a, a, a blue unit, and you would go either to Iraq or Afghanistan. So I, of course, had spent years learning Arabic, so the government and their wisdom sent me to <laughs> Afghanistan. <clears throat> um, but, so is, is that um, similar to like Spanish and Portuguese, where it's like you, you can kind of understand it and there's enough similarity where you can sort of get by, or is it just like so different to where you're really fucking lost? It's, I think it's like probably in between to the point where you're really fucking lost because yeah. there's words, you know, for instance, and we'll talk about it later, but Shafi, who's my, my Terp, uh, who I worked with forever in Afghanistan, like he knew some Arabic and I would always ask him like, what's this mean? And like, they have the same words, but they'll mean totally, totally different. different things. So you can get in trouble quick, but then there's times where you might get lucky yeah. and the sentence you say comes out pretty close to what it would be in Dari. So it's uh, almost like teenager slang nowadays it, where it's like that word doesn't mean that word anymore. Now exactly. It means, yeah. Well, yeah. So it, it, it really didn't help me with the exception of when, you know, obviously a lot of AQ guys were coming in um, into Afghanistan. And if there was an interrogation or something like that, then it would come in. Yeah. Um, but I was also never like a, a four, you know, in Arabic yeah, either. I mean, it, like, you know, I could communicate, um, but I was still in that process when I went to the other. So I would I would do some conversing in Arabic with them, but like, I would still bring a turp because like, this is a, an important national security yeah. <laughs> issue. Yeah. Probably shouldn't be leaning on my. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things that, you know, Arabic, uh, I, I spent a number of years, uh, learning Tagalog kind of similarly, like, you know, was supposed to, I reenlisted to go to Arabic. I wanted to go to DLI in Monterey and, and, uh, they promised that. And then shit gets shuffled around. Now, now you guys are going to Southeast Asia. You're going to the Philippines. We're going to send you to fucking Tagalog school. So Anyway, that's at least the same alphabet. Um, yeah. A lot of words uh, there are in, are in Spanish, actually, because of the, the Spanish uh, conquest that, uh, you know, rampaged through the, the Philippines hundreds of years ago. So there's a lot of Spanish influence. It's not that hard of a language to learn by comparison. Uh, I mean, to me, the fact that there's a totally different alphabet and you're reading it the other direction you know, like you did several years of intensive Arabic training and it still wasn't enough for you to be able to go over there to where like you still needed an interpreter. So to me, I'm not an, I'm not the Bob's from office space. I'm not, I'm no efficiency <laughs> expert, but it seems like what's the fucking point? Like, yeah. do you think that it was worth it? Like to, to look back on it? I think it was worth it to get my foot in the door. But I mean, as far as the, the government's investment in you. No. And, and again, there's some people who spend more time doing it like if, if if you had gone to like hey we're going to send you to to dli like when i was in monterey i went to a private school monterey institute of international studies which i think is middlebury now um but if if the government had sent you and said hey we're, like like mill does we're sending you here for six months two years whatever the case might be and god bless you you're lucky as hell because monterey kicks ass it's an yeah. awesome town um when you come back and only when you come back and you hit this standard will you bring us linguistic value in this particular operation or mission? So, I mean, all, hindsight, no. And again, I don't, I could maybe get to a hotel, yeah. you know, if you drop me <laughs> off in like Jordan or something right now. So it's like, yeah. I don't think so. I mean, and, and, and again, you, you want, when it comes to this stuff, I mean, what we were doing with those missions, we were hunting. I mean, we were simply tasked with hunting and killing HVTs. Yeah. You don't want someone who's like, <laughs> okay at that language yeah. doing a source meet or an interrogation you want a dude who grew up speaking yeah. that language yeah i mean even then right like 
take America as an example. You know, there, there's places where, you know, us growing up in the Midwest, you go into the deep south or to Boston, right. you know, where, where you're not going to fucking understand, you know, what, what somebody's really talking about. Or at a minimum, they're going to know for absolute sure you're not from there. Right. You know, and that's just in this country speaking the same language, you know, whatever. So to me, yeah, I get it. I mean, it just, it seems almost kind of, not kind of, it seems counterproductive and, and right. a complete fucking waste of money to spend most of our guys. I think doing like an abbreviated, you know, four week or six week course where you're learning sentences, like, you know, almost pre-programmed, right. you know, whatever sentences, you know, certain elements that are kind of must haves that you just kind of memorize. I, I think that makes more sense. But I mean, the reality of it is anyway, at this point, like with, with some of the Google Translate technology that's out there, fuck, you almost don't need it at all. No. You know, I mean, it, it, yeah. like that shit's incredible, man. I mean, not to get all Joe Rogan and get way, way off right. fucking topic. Well, but I know, I think you're right. I mean, really, the, the only value that that really brought uh, or that the, the teams brought, and, and now things have changed because Mills kind of built up their own capabilities, so it's not really neat. Everyone's still doing their own thing, but, um, you know, everyone's got to do – do their own. Everyone wants their own fiefdom. Um, but the biggest value was, you know, when you're running those clandestine operations, you're running sources and whatnot is the authorities. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you know, if you weren't trained to do this, you're not cleared to run that kind of operation. And yeah. that's, you know, you guys were the shooters, you know, you, you know, so the, the language part really, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, yeah, it uh, was, it was a waste. Yeah. Um, so when you, you were attached to both uh, army and Navy assets or I was, I was only blue. Okay. Um, did you, were you in Iraq and Afghanistan? No, nope. just I, I, I was in Iraq towards the end, but at that point, with that particular group, only Afghanistan. Yeah, um, I, I know some of the stuff is is a bit on the sensitive side, but I would love to uh, hear some of kind of your experiences there, attached. You know, some of the you know combat missions that you that you were attached to or or a part of, and if you could uh, share uh, whatever you can about your time there, I know people would love to hear that shit. So I was with them. Um, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was, I think it was just over two years with the IA. Um, and then I went to the other agency um, to CIA. But, but with them, which, by the way, we did not get along um, at the time. The DIA um, and CIA. It was just kind of the Omega, you know, our, our team, which was kind of a joint element of, of Blue and us. Uh, and we were just considered Blue because we were attached with them. We deployed as Blue. Us and, and the agency, we shared a space, and we did, we did not get along well. And I remember hating them. It's funny that I ended up, and ironic, I guess, that I ended up spending the lion's share of my, my career in the intel community with them. But um, I was mostly with them in northeastern Afghanistan, and we'd go into Bagram, link up with, with our people, and then, and then take the flight up there. Um, you know, that, that part of the country in Konar and... and um, in Nangarhar, um, south south of it, you know, lots of people coming across there. So you're getting you're getting shelled a lot, and at that time, getting shelled a lot of base. Um, what year years were these? Those that was oh five oh six. Um, so <clears throat> it, it was you know we'd go in for sixty days at a time, 60, 60 90 days at a time, um, and. It, it, it depended on the trip, right? So, like, sometimes you'd have a lot of stuff. You know, one, one of the um, – we were still hunting a lot, it, you know, in the, the aftermath of the events of Lone Survivor. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, hunting from a revenge standpoint, um, as well as some sensitive gear and sensitive items that were out there. So that was still a big priority for us, that. And, of course, you know, goal one of H B, um, going after HVTs. We didn't, we didn't have a ton of combat missions, um, ton of, ton of source meets, ton of clandestine source meets, ton of people coming in. Can you, can, could you walk us through a, a generic scenario of what that is? A source meet and yeah, how so, that goes? So a lot of times in that country, uh, or in a war zone like that, you'll get a, you'll get a walk in. Um, so this is somebody volunteering. Someone who volunteers, um, you know, you'll find out other ways too. I mean, just to, as a quick sidestep, you could see through SIGIN information or through other human uh, human intelligence reporting, other reporting that this figure here could have good access to someone you're trying to capture or kill. So, if you have access to that person, you know, then you could try and develop that relationship. But really, the way it works in war zones, a lot of the time, that's that's more traditional, you know, clandestine operations. 
you'll get a walk in. Hey, the Taliban, Al Qaeda, I have access to them, you know, yada, yada, yada. Here's, here's how most of them are, are just trying to peddle information for money um, and are full of shit. But you'll get some good ones, and, and sometimes those good ones lead to better ones. So they'll come in, and you know, you'll have traditional mill at the at the base who kind of vets them, make sure, hey, this guy's not strapped with a with an IED. He's not he's not going to just clack off and kill people. And then they'll they'll pass it along, and depending on the threshold of information, said dude claims he has, we may or may not meet with him, and. Let's say it goes well. He comes in. We meet with him. Here's some tea. You know, what do you have? Shoot, shoot, shoot us straight. Don't fuck with us because we got a lot of people who are doing this. We got a lot of stuff we got to do. Um, I have access to this. Okay, and then you, and then you work on trying to vet. And obviously, I'm simplifying all this. Sure. Very much, but you you try and vet that through through all the different means that you've got. Um, and if that starts to work, then they eventually might become more of a permanent asset for you, at which point you, you don't want them coming to base because uh, they're in a lot of danger. You know, yeah. the, the, some of the people they hate more than anyone over there is, is the people who work with Americans, not just Americans. So um, so then you start to do some clandestine meetings. You, you know, you'll set up locations. You'll Then you'll get a little bit more mousy and, and, and you know, work on tradecraft and, and do clandestine pickups and, and go meet in secure places, which sometimes is back at the base, but you'll how you get them there is, is clandestine. I know that, you know, using discretion and being smart about how you talk about any of that, the last thing I want to do is put any of our guys or their guys in danger. Is there anything that you can share that's like a cool tactic uh, or, you know, something that, um, you know, maybe isn't used anymore that you did use with success that, uh, you know, was something that was kind of kind of cool? For like the pickups and stuff? Yeah, or? <clears throat> like a way to, to deceive or be, be deceptive. Well, you've got to have, first of all, you got to have a smart asset because if they can't follow instructions and a lot of them aren't, by the way, I yeah. mean, like they just, they just fuck things up. Um, and then you just kind of are, are playing cleanup. But a lot of it's, I mean, it's, it's really, a, a, it's not common sense in the sense of what you and I would, or anyone back here in the States would do if they're picking up their friend, like, but you know, you always assume you're being followed. And a lot of times <laughs> you are, you always assume there's eyes on, um, and it depends on your environment that you're in too. If you're operating in Amman versus Asadabad, you know, it, the CI profile is a lot different with, you know, who's, who's watching you and this, that, and the other. But it's a lot of, you know, remote places where no one's looking or, hey, we think we're being tailed. So we're going to pick you up. We're going to, they're going to, in theory, keep their distance because, you know, unlike the movies, uh, and that's not always true. Sometimes they do it just as bad. But, you know, there, <laughs> there's some distance there, right? You don't want to just be like right up somebody's ass in their car. There's some space. So you're going to make the turn. And then you're going to make another turn. And you're going to have them sitting there where they're not going to see what happens after that turn. Yeah. So you've got enough say, hey, we've got five seconds to get you in the car and then keep going. They're not going to see that you've gotten in. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's lots of just simple things like that. Again, you know, it, it, and it's, it's different stuff, but you, you do a brush pass, for example, which you don't really do in Afghanistan. You don't do brush passes there. But like, can you, can you explain a brush? That's pass? like where you're like doing a handoff to people walking by and an exchange is made. You know, it's all where you do it. Um, if someone sees you do that, um, it's not going to work. If you're going through and you don't necessarily see these types of situations, but I can think of one place in my mind that's that was perfect and it's you know you're going through and the hallway jots this way this way this way again where visibility is lost for a little bit you do yeah. that it's the same thing applies for for seat you know clandestine pickups yeah. um you know you you want to uh, uh, assuming you have and even if you don't assume that you do have a tail protect that source because you got to protect them and i remember when i first got in i was green as all get out like anybody is when they first start and overly aggressive, you know, trying to overcompensate, kind of like, you know, fuck the source, like whatever, like let's get the information and whatever happens to them happens to them. It's like, well, no, that doesn't make sense. We can get more out of them yeah, if, if you're smart, if we're it. smart and we protect them. So you learn that quickly. Um, Did you have instances where you were working with somebody and they got found out and got killed and, and you found out about it? Yeah, no, we've had lots of, so I've had, I've had sources have, you know, you know, electric screwdrivers into them. Um, that one came back and went back to work 
Um, that was in Iraq. Um, sources get killed. I mean, it happens. It, yeah. It's just, I mean, is it is it ever ha, did it ever happen where it was like you got their head in a in, a, in the mail type type shit? Or I've, I've like, not gotten that, but we've seen videos. Um, they'd send you a video of them. You know, they'd put out. You know, they still do, but back then, in particular, you'd you'd see videos all the time. I'm sure you saw them on oh, deployments yeah. too. And and honestly, as sick and fucked up as it sounds, I think it actually kind of helps get your your mind right. Like. I'd come in and be like, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't want to see that. Like, well, let's, let's see it. It'll keep it, you from getting complacent. Exactly. Like, that's who we're going against. Is there a worst example that you guys came across? No, I think they're all pretty, pretty similar. There was, there was, um, I forget the, the guy's name um, up in, in Asadabad. Uh, when I was in Asadabad, this didn't happen in Asadabad. Um, but they had just chopped off an American's head. And I watched that video. And that one's, you know, particularly bad because it's, it's one of your people. Yeah. Um, you know, so that one, that one rings out. I can't think of the dude's name. Um, but <clears throat> it wasn't the uh, journalist, was it? Daniel Pearl? It was Pearl. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was Pearl. That's what it yeah, was. I remember that. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so, and I think that was 06. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, <sighs> That, that, that so when I was there, my, my you know, I, again, I'm young. I'm young. I've just gotten my intel training. I've just, you know, contrary to common belief, we don't shoot a lot of firearms in football locker rooms. So I've just gotten comfortable with all that. And we've, we've sped through and gotten more than most do um, and gotten some really good training, all sorts of, you know, all, all, all sorts of great tools to have in, in your, your toolkit. But then you get there. And, you know, you land at Pogram and everyone's clean shaven. You got a bunch of 10th Mountain dudes there. You got a bunch of just conventional, great, great kids, but they're conventional. And you come in and we have the best gear, you know, top to bottom, you know, because every, everything that Blue had, we had. So we've got all the best weapons, all this stuff. You've got beards. You've got this, that, and the other. Can you say, uh, as it relates to Army, Navy, Blue, Green, uh, if it was Tier 1 or not? Can you it was Tier 1, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. So we only worked with either Damn Neck or, or the guys down at Bragg. Yeah. So, uh, and then we'd, we'd fly out of Bragg. So, um, so you come in, and you're with them, and you literally are at the top. Yeah. But for me, I'm like, I just started. Like, I'm, I'm like – day one and you've jumped up to here so the pressure i the, the biggest thing i can remember about that is not the operations that were done not the the intel that we gathered and and things that we stopped but it's it was the pressure of like all right this is what you wanted yeah now you have it welcome to the game bro careful you're, what you wish for you're in a war zone and everyone's looking at you and i and nothing it never hit me more than we're flying out i'm i'm i uh was the only guy from our team, came, you know, from Bagram who was going up to Asadabad. So I'm, I'm waiting on my flight on a Chinook. Keeps getting kanked. I'm just chilling. It was awful. It was so freaking boring. You know, there's just nothing nothing to do. It's your first trip there. You know, I'm sleeping in a, a bee hut with um, <clears throat> some rangers who are on a different schedule. So you're trying to, you know, you know they're, they're, they're doing stuff at night. I'm just there. I'm just passing through. I have no operational job there so you're just hanging out and then finally finally the it's it's time to go the bird's gonna go and it's me and a bunch of 10th mountain guys and we're chilling out in the tarmac waiting and again i've got all this stuff i've got a big beard at the time which whether you needed it or not whatever but like i've got you know i just i i, I fit the part i looked the part and you know we had the hk 416s were the thing back then you know just totally everything on there you know everything's Looking good. So you've got these 10th Mountain cats who are like, man, who's this fucking guy? Who the fuck is that? Like, they're coming up. By the way, all of them, you know, and, and kudos to them. And I pray that all of them made it home safe. But they're out there screwing around. They're flagging people with their weapons. It's like, man, like, I'm here. I'm new. And you guys are terrifying. <laughs> like, like, no, like, no one's playing. Well, you're playing. used to dealing with. You know the the tip of the tip, right? right. You're, so you're you're dealing with pre cum basically. Yeah, basically, right? yeah, yeah. That's that's the way to put it. So they're all coming over and asking questions, and little do they know, I'm green as all get out. And we fly up, and we're starting to fly up. <clears throat> and I don't remember where we were in the journey, maybe midway through. And all of a sudden, we're going down, not like out of control down, but we make we make a hard landing, 
in in like it was like a big cornfield remote village and the birds down so we've all got to get out and set up a perimeter and all these young kids are looking at me like <laughs> what the fuck do we do like what do we, i'm like why am i telling you <laughs> like all right guys i mean i mean here we go like don't let the beard and weapons fool you like like <laughs> I'm, I'm an intel guy I, like i'm just as new as you and 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 apparently i'm in charge here like so so you know all ended well and and we got a new we got a new bird and we got uh apaches to to help you know fly us to our destination we got there all was all was good but it was an intense moment when you're when you're brand freaking yeah. new to, to just you know boom, thud everyone off <clears throat> like all right here we go um yeah so so that the pressure of that first trip i was going through some stuff with um my fiance at the time who was also an intel collector bad idea by yeah. the way don't have no, don't do that um you know so there was a lot of pressure on that first trip um we also, you know, again, we were working on the the, the aftermath of, of Red Wings and, and all the stuff with with Latrell and those guys. And um, I, I want to there's I, I won't tell the the, the whole story because I don't want to piss Marcus off because he's got his own version and and that's cool. Um, but one of the guys in that movie is portrayed as a good guy, one of the Afghans, mm -hmm. um, and it's probably obvious who I'm talking about. But the 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 dude was was not a good guy like he was he was playing both sides we almost arrested him multiple times and if or, or captured him multiple times and if it weren't for his role and thank god he did that role whatever his his reasoning was for that um i mean we the the the, the unit tried to hit him multiple times like no you can't do that it would be a pr nightmare and we got shut down um wow no shit huh? but he was bringing in you know this one dude who came in to assassinate the police chief, he was harboring him. He was staying with him. Someone else, we were like, this is great, because there was tons of DROG, derogatory information on this guy um, that I'm talking about. And it was like, oh, we can go get him. And now this guy's here. We can get two for one. This is great. This is like a bonus. Like, everyone wins. No, you can't do that. You can't do that till that joker leaves the house. Yeah. Leave him alone. Um, so that guy had a fucking get-out-of-jail-free pass get out of jail. permanently, basically. Yeah. Huh? Yep. Wow. So and again, there's there's circumstance like maybe yeah. there's something we're missing, but we had all sorts of yeah of reason sure. reasons for going after this dude, and we couldn't. Yeah, well, I mean, I think in in that environment, I think mo in most cases, most of the guys in those positions are opportunists. Yeah, you know, and so they they take each interaction as a okay, what's the best for me? Right. You know, and and in some cases it's fucking over Americans and in some cases it's helping them. You yeah. know, so I mean to me it's it's probably that simple. Hundred percent. Well, Afghans are for rent, they're not yeah. for sale. That's always been yeah the deal we've seen, you know, whether it's Dostum or, you know, whoever these guys are, they switch yeah. a gazillion times. So uh, while you were in this role, um, what would what would you say that your job was basically to to augment the, the units that you were attached to at that time? So our job was, to, you know, uh, we we're the combat operations officer, as it was called. Um, so you're basically the, the, the human intel collector for that team. So you've got your corpsman, you've got your comms dude, we're the intel dude. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to, you know, meetings, you're, you're, you're setting up the meetings, running the sources, find the sources to get actionable info for the yeah. team to, to go on. And a lot of times they would go without, depending on the, and then sometimes it, it just, it depended on who the the team who you were deploying with too was yeah. uh, and what your trust was with them. Is there a, a liaison piece between you and, and the agency that you were with at the time where like you're kind of the go between, between Langley or the Pentagon or, you know, whoever your contacts are back in the States, like is there, is there a go, a back and forth there? Well, there's, there, was, there was folks at Bagram who kind of served at that. Um, you know, the agency usually runs the, the show in the war zone. Um, so we, our, we, we literally shared a door with them that was supposed to be open for collaboration. It usually at the time was not. Yeah. Uh, things have gotten better than that. But again, like I, I said back, back then, I was like, man, these guys are dicks. Like, they, they don't leave the base. They would look at us. We'd, we'd get kitted up to go out the door every day. And you'd see these big eyed folks working there, you know, some of which were trained collectors who were supposed to be out doing stuff, but they were like, what, what you yeah. like, you guys okay. are going out kitted up in a thin skin vehicle or in a, 
you know, I, I, I'll, I'll never forget that too, because they'd look at you like that. And then they, <clears throat> again, they didn't like, because we were, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with the tier one guys and we kind of ran the roost, even though administratively speaking, the, the base chief was, was an agency guy. We, um, you know, everyone just kind of looked at us different. The, the conventional guys who were on base wanted to, to be there. It was, it was literally like a scene out of the movie. They're, they're, um, I forget what his rank was, but whoever's in charge of them, they're, all, they're, they're brass, would get pissed at us for coming into the chow hall and flip-flops and beards like, yeah. like y'all are a bunch of dicks. Like, and we're just doing a job, bro. Yeah. Um, so it's like the scene from uh, Black Hawk Down. It, 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 yeah. it, I mean, it literally was like that. Like, I yeah. remember one of their dudes coming up and, like, giving me an earful. Like, hey. Yeah. This is just so that's what I, we do. This is what we do. I didn't yeah. make the rules. Like yeah. you know, why don't you guys put some flip flops? I don't. Like, I yeah. don't fucking care. Like, do, yeah. but anyways, so you'd have that, and we would get into it with um, the chief because at the time, you know, agency. There's always rivalries. All the places there's rivalries. So there's DIA, CIA. There's you know, uh, JSOC, CIA. There's 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 some rivalries. Even though there's great coordination too, and again, in a lot of instances, and at least in my experiences over the time after that, it got a lot better. But we, um, we just kind of did our own thing there, and we would liaise. We'd have a meeting every morning with them, um, which, was, which was painful. But, you know, had a deconfliction meeting every morning with them, which was led by the agency. And, uh, man, the, oh, I forget the guy's name. This, the, the one chief, he did not, he did not love us. Um, needed us, but didn't love us. Yeah. Um, but one night we went out and... You know, we're in this this kind of side building, concrete building over there that was just for agency and JSOC. And we're on top. I didn't know that we were. Maybe maybe Rob and some of the other guys did, but I, we're, we're drinking. Um, we're, we're having a good time, and we had doused a bunch of uh, golf balls <laughs> and chem light fluid. <laughs> Uh, and tax dollars hard at work. Yes. So we always <laughs> had to get new golf balls and maybe some new clubs sent out in the shipment. So, you know, Xbox time is done. Like, let's go, let's take our, uh, let's take our whiskey upstairs on the roof and hit golf balls into the village. So, <laughs> which I, I swear, I, there's probably still people, if they're still alive in that village who are like, it was what the fuck happened that night? There was yeah. blue and green balls, like, like Fly. hitting us. Uh, so we're up there, you know, we got our nods on drinking, hitting these golf balls turns out we're right on top where the our, where we're hitting is the base chief's room god that's fucking priceless he was pissed dude that is awesome and, and the, the the dude who was in charge then rob went down in extortion 17 um he was a stud yeah good dude yeah um <clears throat> how long did you uh how long were you in that that position that role doing those uh deployments all all in about two years. two years not all not all deployment time some of that you know yeah, time back, back home and and training yeah but one thing i was curious about when you were talking about the meets and then we'll move on to the next phase uh, of your career but <clears throat> um with the with the driving to, to meet and pick up sources um back then were you guys rolling in like the the mercedes s class v12 up armored fucking badass vehicles that were fast and armored and whatever what were you driving so we depended on what we were doing or where who was going with us so it could be anything from like a thin skin toyota corolla you know with mismatched color panels to fit in to to fit in um which was better yeah. you know and that was another thing the agency thought we were fucking crazy like you guys are going out in a thin skin like what if someone what if yeah. someone shoots the vehicle like yeah, well, hiding in plain sight exactly yeah. so um and then we had a, you know, we'd have JTV, like, you know, joint tactical vehicle, like we're, you know, we just, like we're going heavy on this one. Um, we didn't, I think we had a, a, an up armored land cruiser or two, or two then, um, you know, once I went to the agency, we had a lot more of that. It was yeah. a lot more of land cruisers, Mercedes. So at the agency, there, there was a period in the mid, mid to late 2000s where there were like the V12 S class Mercedes that, that were armored and. I don't. I don't remember seeing. Um, you talking about like a G wagon? No, no, like uh, like the the sedan, like the the four door, like oh, they four door sedan. Fifty. No. Yeah. I, well, they might have had one. We certainly didn't. Yeah. I don't remember if they had one or not. Again, they didn't really leave the base. Yeah. They'd have people come in. Yeah. Um. So again, maybe they did. I knew what we had, yeah. but um. Yeah. All right. So you do that for a couple of years, and then what was what was next? So I came home. Um. Tried to fix. 
you know, my broken relationship with which, um, you know, great person, but thankfully I didn't because, you know, who I married was is the best person and, and uh, you know, just worked its, itself out. But um, took a, a little bit of time with that, trying to figure out next steps, transitioned over, had a buddy at the agency, um, like, hey, you should come, come get on board with this. Um, and so I, I came over there and was working on some Iraq stuff for a short period of time. And then this, this other program that was going in Afghanistan needed some more help, which is where I met our mutual friend um, and started working with him. And it was a covert action program um, that leaned more on my skills. So I went and, and did that for them. And we were on and off. We were typically there six to nine months a year um, and did it in perpetuity because one, the program was really important and brought a lot of, of value to the government and, and, and the agency. But, um, you know, the way that, and this kind of goes into, I was thinking about, I was, well, I was watching your episode with, with Alan last week uh, or, or uh, a few weeks ago. And, and when, <clears throat> when you have, we are basically the subject matter experts because the way that the agency does it, and I think is so dumb and it's not always the case, there's some outliers, is they'll, they want you for the betterment of your career to do a bunch of different things. So you'll have people who will come through there and they'll, including their R&R &R and their breaks, they'll be there nine months and then they move on. And now we think you should go to Paris oh, wow. or you should go here. And again, there are outliers. There's some staffers that I worked with because at that point, I, I, we, myself and a lot of people started switching to, to being contractors. And there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of staffers who do cycle back in and, and maybe it, it could be years, but they come back in, they have at least some knowledge. So is it a case where nobody's ever in one spot long enough to get really good at exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. So you've got a lot of that with the exception of some of these programs, which again, you know, what most people don't understand about the, the government and how it works. And it's not even just the agency. It's a lot of places uh, is you've got former people who are either, you know, special operations operator or an Intel operator or whatever the case might be who are now consultants and the lion's share of the actual real shit that gets done is getting done by, by them. Um, because all these other people, they don't even have it in fairness to them. They don't, a lot of them have, don't have a chance. Yeah. You know, I, I know a couple of guys who were there who wanted to come back, really liked it, liked the war zone track and like, now, Nope, you need to, you need to move on and do something else or you're going to have trouble getting promoted. Um, it's like, well, who fucking care? Like, I don't want to get, I, I'm not, in it for the promotion. I'm in it because this matters. Yeah. And those type of people struggle to grow and climb there. Um, but I, anyways, all that to say, went over there, <clears throat> took part in this, this, um, the CA program that, that I did for a long, long time. Um, can you describe what that encompassed? Yeah. So we trained, um, trained and advised local forces. So, um, there's a lot more depth to that, and I'll give a little bit more depth and, and color than that. But we, we trained local forces, operated with local forces, and depending on what your specialty was, you know, you, you did different things with them. So, I mean, literally there was people who trained them on the most rudimentary basic skills that have nothing to do with operations, to people who, you know, trained on weapons and firearms, to intel operations, to military operations, to, you know, or paramilitary operations in this case. Um, and we did that a long time. Um, so it was kind of a weird thing. So I, you know, it, it, my career is, was really just a strange deal because it was like everyone, everyone assumes, cause I always ran in the paramilitary circles that I was, you know, in mill before and that I was a in, former action guy. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's like, <laughs> but it was like, no, nah, I'm like, no, nah, I was a civilian. I just got to do cool shit. And then I went to this place and it was the same thing. You know, I, you know, we had this unique program that had, periods where it was less sexy and periods that were really sexy. And we got to do some awesome stuff, work with great people um, and, and train and work with the Afghans. And, and, and as usual, you know, the advisors usually have to be more involved. Yeah. And it kind of depends that some advisors like literally are just super by the book guys and, and probably to their credit. All right. You know, we've trained now we got to be hands off. It's like, nah, like they're going to fuck it up. So I'll, I'll just go with them. We'll just do this or whether it's, you know, hitting the house, doing an interrogation, you know, yeah. this is a good learning op. I want you just sit down and shut up. Like, um, so we, you know, we, some of us were more aggressive than others. Um, 
and you, you, you've got to find a way to battle the leadership again because you've got people coming in. Sands a rare few. You've got people coming in from D.C. who have no fucking clue what they're doing telling in a war zone, do. telling you what to do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've twice, I've, I was told, told by one chick who is a nice lady. <laughs> nice lady. That's where <laughs> to it me, stops. If that's how you describe it, a case officer or, or what. You know, yeah, she's a nice, nice lady. person. Like, yeah, I don't know what, that you bring value, to, yeah. you know, but like you're. That's not the best description for somebody in that position. But, uh, you know, deputy chief. So second in command of the entire country. And we had gone to do something and it was a very successful operation, by the way. Now, technically speaking, it wasn't cleared, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 they had shut it down. I just I thought that uh, you know I thought it made more sense to do it. So um, we did it. It paid off in spades. Maybe maybe not the right move, but it paid off. But we're having this meeting the next day, and and she she told me and a couple others, I'm not willing to lose my job over you getting killed. Like, oh okay, all right. I'm glad that we just kind of know where we are. And then I had another guy who told who told me and my partner. Um, we had, we had gotten shot at that night. Um, wasn't a big deal. Like it just was, you know, it was, it was literally an, an Afghan guard. We're going to do night vision training with this unit we were training. And I don't know if he was new. I don't know what his deal was, but you know, you know, the environment you've, you've been in bad situations. You've been in medium situations. You've been in good situations. You can kind of get a sense. Dude shot at us. We were in our car. We were up armored, trying to pull into where we were going to do this. They have, it, the night probably didn't go well for, for that dude because, um, you know, shooting at your American partners doesn't, doesn't go well for, for him. But we're like, all right, like, well, let's, let's go. Let's just let's carry on. we got training to do. Got out there. I lit up a cigar. We've, we've, got, we've got them. We're in, like, primo. We're not, like, going all in yet. So kind of talking about it, briefing what we're going to do. And call back and say, hey, um, just so you know, in case the, the Afghans tell you this, like, no big deal. We're good to go. We're proceeding ahead with, with training. Our guy was such a little bitch. The, ch the chief of the, of, the, of the station, best one we've ever had, um, he was out at a dinner. You know, who knows, president, whoever the hell he was talking with. And <clears throat> so they didn't, they didn't get a hold of him at first. So our guy flips out. He's like, you need to come home right now. You need to get your ass back here. So we come home. On the way home, it was just a weird night. This place where we're at, there's a bunch of towers on this big compound. So we get sh shot at by a guard coming in. And then these other guards, and we're rolling heavy. Like, this is a, it's a strike force. Like, so it's a bunch of their special operations guys and so we're rolling heavy out of here multiple vehicles dudes on guns in the back and this one guard tower draws down on us <laughs> like what the fuck are you doing we're on the same compound you just saw us go by we were at the training spot like we're on the same team these are afghan these are guards. afghans yeah. yeah so it turns into like one of those scenes in the you know remember the movie the rock mm-hmm you know, you've got the people with the high ground. Everyone's pointing at each other. Everyone's pointing. Everyone's shouting. I get out of the car. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Meanwhile, though, because it was unexpected for our own guards that we trained to draw down on us, yeah. we, we ram into the back of one of our Afghan trucks. We're in a Land Cruiser. We run into the back of that. The front of this thing is, is hanging off, making all sorts of weird noises. We're like, awesome. This, this night, <laughs> we just got called home, yeah. and now we're bringing home a, a wrecked vehicle because our own... Fucking people drew, you know, drew down on us. So that ends fine. We go home. We get back. And we get sat down in the office of this one boss who's flipping out. Going to send us home that night. You're getting on a bird tonight. You're going home. Like, for what? Yeah. Like, we just were, we were. Did they say what? We were doing, he was like, you, you, you caused, basically, he didn't want to have to have hard conversations with leadership. He was out of his element there. He didn't like that we were confident. It probably didn't help that I was laughing about it when I told him what had happened on the range. Yeah. Um, he didn't just like that we were like, it's no so big deal. About yeah. It. yeah. He's like, hey, but he, he was like, hey, boss, like we, we didn't perceive it as a threat. We carried on. We had a whole strike force unit around us, by the way. Lots of... Lots of guns that were there to help us if anything went bad. Like, 
we're good. Yeah. And, and these guys are, were pretty good and, and, and capable, you know, soldiers as well. So he's like, I don't care. It's not your job to decide if you are in danger or not. Okay. I was like, okay. <laughs> like, I was like, with all due respect. Who, who the fuck is it? Like, <laughs> I've been in this country a long ass time. Yeah. And I think I get it a little bit more than you. Anyways, he, he gets pissed. We, we go down. The chief gets out of his dinner. We go down there. He, he likes the two of us, my partner and I, and makes exactly what our guy didn't want to happen. He didn't want to look like an ass. Made him look like an ass. He was like, it's, oh, was you two? You two were there? He was like, yeah. they're fine. Go back to training tomorrow. Yeah. Basically, shut up. Here's a coloring book. Yeah. Um, go yeah. back to your office. But, but that's the kind of mindset there is you've got these people who come through Hey, we should do this and try this right now. We tried that two years ago. Yeah. How about this? We tried that last week. How about yeah. like, like, yeah, I mean, I, it's the classic, like people are, are intimidated by their own position. Yeah. You know, they feel in over their head and they, and they feel like there's an insecurity that they have to overcompensate for. And so yeah. they slap their dick on the table, you know, but uh, again, it's, it's such a dangerous environment to have that issue. It is. Well, and let us, <clears throat> let us make you look good. Yeah. Like that. I mean, that's the thing. Like you, you're, you're about a career. You want to, you yeah. want to eventually be an SES Cool. We'll help that happen. Yeah. What like, is SES? A senior executive service. It's like they're like Operation. senior brass. Like, yeah. it, you know, once you get past GS-15, it goes to SES and only certain people are selected. So it's kind of like, you know, in the Intel community, the, the equivalent of, of, of generals and yeah. whatnot. You know, so, you. But, <clears throat> but it's like, let us, let us make you look good. Yeah. Uh, so to go down like a laundry list of the, of the different capabilities that you were helped helping train in all of the host nation forces. What, what does that list look like? So interrogations, um, we, I started a, um, a, I'll call it like a gray site type program, um, where we, where we took certain people, um, that were of more interest and, and had more special conversations in a special place with them. Um, so we got that going, got them, getting us better actionable intelligence out of that. Um, and then, um, so a lot of that, a lot of just how, here's how you run an Intel operation. Um, so, you know, I, my job, and we, we kind of like, you know, a lot of other things, we'd come together at points and, and then do our own things at points. So my job was primarily working with their counterterrorism department, Intel operations, interrogations, all of that stuff, working with their leadership, um, you know, and kind of, it wasn't really supposed to be this way. And it wasn't just me. It's just, it just kind of how it worked. But you kind of are dictating how they do things. Mm -hmm. um, so when you weren't doing operations, sometimes there was internal drama between the Afghans, like their headquarters element. Like, you can't do this. And then you'd go over to the headquarters element and be like, we're going to do this. Yeah. Like, if you want funding to come in, yeah, shut up. Um, so there's a lot of that. And then towards the back half of that... Um, we, we stood up this new strike force and that was, you know, so there would be, you know, it was more traditional, but you know, war zone, traditional Intel before. And then it went back to kind of like the start of my career was more PM style working with the strike force. I was the Intel guy, but we would go with, you know, so we would PM paramilitary. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Sorry. Paramilitary. So, um, you know, we weren't, we weren't GB, we weren't ground branch, which is, exclusively their mission paramilitary they did their own thing they did similar things but for this particular unit we um we trained them you know gave them everything they needed and they were grinding and then when appropriate we'd go with sometimes you know sometimes maybe we went with when we weren't supposed to but um but it was that was kind of that was the best the best part of it was was towards the end Getting, getting that part done. We had great people. We had great Afghans we were working with, great Terps. Our team of American advisors was good. Um, so so uh, the air quotes gave them everything that they needed. You hear a lot about the however many fucking tens of billions of dollars of equipment that was left in Afghanistan. I'm curious. I, I know, you know, we did a lot of uh, foreign internal defense is what we called it, you know, training foreign forces did you guys internally have a kind of a standing rule written or even a non-written understanding of we're, we're only going to give them to this capability equipment wise, and we're only going to train them to a certain level. Like, is there a, an actual 
written protocol, you know, or, or a direction that's official, not just talking amongst the boys saying, Hey dude, let's not give these guys the whole fucking playbook. Is there an right. actual directive from above saying, Hey, teach them to this level. So for equipment, yeah, there definitely was, you know, it was usually like a generation or so behind. So whether you're talking about, you know, night vision, night or, vision or whatever, um, you know, what firearms we gave. And then also, you know, being on the Intel side, even though it's pretty obvious, even to the, the casual observer, what's going on in, in war zones like that, you know, you can't have it seem like some of this equipment came from us. So it's got to be stuff that they could 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 in theory procure somewhere yes yeah, so, i mean in in some instances and this is where maybe our mutual friend uh is probably the most involved with with what you were doing or, or how you knew him but there are a lot of procurements kind of war dog style from the movie yep <clears throat> hence the uh, the intro uh smart ass remark but um <laughs> there's a lot of that right yeah. i mean that's big business of yep of these big fucking arms and weapons deals whether it's through you know, to your point, you know, acquiring or procuring them through, you know, Russian or Chinese or Iranian or, you know, whatever, like that's gotta be like some shit straight out of the movie, some dicey fucking yeah. shit, right? Yeah. And that's, you know, being the fact that it was a CA program, there's a lot of stuff there that, you know, like we can't get into, but it, you know, I'll just say, you know, you look at war dogs, you look at Charlie Wilson's war, you look at some of that stuff and, there was some crazy ass shit happening. Yeah. And, and that's not far off, right? No, yeah, no, like, no, it's, it's um, pretty accurate. It's pretty accurate. I'm telling you again, like we said at the very beginning of the show, most people don't get the opportunity, even if they're trained for it, don't get the opportunity. It's a little different during the GWAT, I guess, but like, don't get the opportunity to go out and do cool stuff. Like I was just, I backed into it. I was just lucky. Like yeah. I, but I got to do, some cool stuff that I, I can't talk about all of it, but it's like I, the people I've met, the things we've done, the stories that we tell when we get together, um, you know, and light up a cigar and, and have a drink. It's like, holy shit. Like we yeah. got to do some cool ass shit. Yeah. Like I, I'd, I'd love to, for what you can share, have you share that. Uh, but right before that, just back to the question of, I know the equipment, it's, you know, a generation or two behind, but was there a standing for, for training? Yeah. Like, so for, you know, our protocols, I don't know how, um, you know, some of the other guys, like GB and some of them, what theirs were. Um, and maybe there were specific ones that I, that, that we had that I just don't remember, but I don't specifically r remember them, at least as it pertained to the one strike force unit. Like, yeah. like we, we wanted them to be a badass element that could go out and execute operations. And they did, I mean, the, their op tempo was through the roof. It was frankly, it was probably too high. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on the intel side, there would be. I, I definitely remember that. So if we're teaching, you know, interrogation or we're teaching clandestine operations, we would definitely dumb that down because we don't want them to know. Because, again, Afghans are for rent, not for sale. A lot of them turn on you. You, yeah. get, you get paid more today by, you know, AQ or the Talibs. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're in trouble. I had, I had a chirp who was arrested for wanting to assassinate me. Um, not the one who's living in my house now. <laughs> but, like, you know, that stuff happens. Yeah. Like, it's they have families. They're survivalists there. It's they, yeah. they they were born into a shitty country. Yeah. Um. So you know, on the intel side, it was definitely like uh, you know, when it comes to interrogation, like we don't want them to know the games that yeah. we're playing with them because it's not like the movies. It's not all this you know torture and shove them in a box and do this. Yeah. Like as that stuff happens, sure, but like it's just a mind fuck. Yeah. Like you're just. Well, I mean, it, it, it seems like more of it is good cop than bad cop, right? Oh yeah. 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 Well, and when it gets back up, honestly, the things that I would do, you know, the technology that we can do to get images or information on family members and other places is pretty. That's um, enough. It's amazing. Yeah. You bring in family most of the time. If you're not, if you're not doing good cop stuff, you bring in family. These people are about almost all over the world. People are about their family. Yeah. Family first. So, you know. You oh, how's so and so doing at this school? And you're like, what? It, exactly. Oh. I remember one. <laughs> One particular operation, um, which was the one where the lady, part of the operation where the lady said that I'm not willing to lose my job over you getting killed, is you know, we got this high value target. I had to go. Actually, I had to go. I had to. Not, you know, our people wouldn't do it. Um, they wouldn't do it. I, I, I was like, you're wrong. This is what this is going to lead to, and this is not about me. This is more about how dumb <laughs> the leadership was at the time. 
this guy will lead us to this guy. No, I won't. You know, we're, we're the agency. We only work on the highest of high value targets. Okay. All right. Sometimes you got to get that middle fish. Like, it's okay. It's okay to come. It's not going to hurt your pride to come down. So Yeah, get a base hit once in a while. Exactly. Let's just get on. They wouldn't do it. So, I, you know, at the time, was good friends with a bunch of the, the folks from Blue. And they had stood up their Intel component a lot more than at that point. They basically had replaced my old job from, from you know, a decade prior. It was like, hey, look, here's the deal. Here's what this is. They were like, oh, we know who that guy is. Well, here's what this guy can lead to. We, we, I was like, all right, you sure you guys don't want to do this agency? No, we're not doing it. Don't, and you don't do it either. It's a waste of time. Okay. So we, we, um, I went and talked to my buddies over there and we, we worked with some folks on the other side of the border in Pakistan as well. Got this dude and then led to this massive HV2 who we also got. The, 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 the agency staffer who told me no was so pissed because he, he looked like shit because, yeah. like, how do we get this HVT? It was like the way that we told you we were going to get the HVT. Um, but that guy, the, the, he's in there, and he didn't want to spill. He was a top financier for AQ. But he broke with a, a picture of his daughter, like, wow. who was, I, I can't tell you how we got it, um, but it was pretty damn cool how we got it. And it was so. How was it presented to him? Can you kind of recreate that that scenario? Yeah, he's sitting there, and you know these they got they um, detainees got really clever over the years in Afghanistan. You know they'd seen they have, a lot of them have been arrested and detained by U.S. forces multiple times. So they know the game. They know the game, and or they had friends or family members. They know that if we can't get them pinned down on something in seventy two hours, they're gone. So they just fuck around for three days. Smile at you, lie at you, whatever, whatever their tactic is, but they tell you nothing, and then they're free to go. And, th- and those things got worse, too, as the, as the war went on. It got to the point where... Like some, the rules of engagement. The rules of engagement. Sometimes you'd be on the way home, and you'd have to cut a guy loose. Now nah, we don't have enough to keep... So we haven't even talked to him yet. Like, yeah. but, but they knew that they could get out. <clears throat> but he, uh, you know, it, 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 sometimes it's just a Hail Mary, too. It's a hope and a prayer. Like, this could work, this might not work. But we, we were able to get a picture of his daughter over where she was and just subtle, you know, subtly lit it over, slid it over. Um, was it you that did it? I, yeah. Asked, asked about her and um, just well, to let him know like, Hey, well, you, you like this little girl. I can presume, right? This, these aren't my words, but you like this little girl. If you ever want to fucking see this little girl again, let's start playing ball here. But it was the fact that like, you knew who she was. I knew who she was and where she's and at. Where she's at. Yeah. And I, you know, as, a, as a father, like, yeah. you're going to get me to talk? Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, you have my attention. Exactly. Uh, what he, was, his eyes were like, I yeah, mean, he... Curious the demeanor shift. Oh, dude, he, he fucking just, he went like ghost mode. Like, like he froze. I think his heart must have stopped. He, he was just... <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a weird position, you know. Similarly, as a father, like I I can empathize with with the emotion that would you know that I would be in in that position. But on the same token, like dude, you put yourself in this position by right. doing the shit that you're doing. You know, yeah. uh, man, that's fucking wild. Um, of the shit that you can share, I know you've done a lot of cool shit, and I know a lot of it you can't talk about. But for the things that you can talk about, is there kind of a uh, a list, uh, like a highlight reel of things that you can share that, that you could go down and, and tell us about? So any of the, because I wanted to be more mill, and again, I never was mill. I just got to do mill-like things. Um, any of that stuff was always my favorite. I liked the camaraderie the most with the people I operated with in those circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the Intel side, one of the coolest, coolest things was um, th- there's a prison there called Policharki. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a big pr- It's like their big gen pop prison in Kabul. Technically, it's just outside on the fringe of Kabul. But they would send people there, and all sorts of crazy shit would go down in this prison. And everyone, the, the worst of the worst people were in this prison. If they weren't at, like, Bagram with U.S., personnel they were there if the afghans put them away they were there and a lot of times people would who went to bagram would eventually get transferred to afghan 
you know, was, was it a, a loose security in terms of people constantly breaking out and shit getting smuggled in or like, so the, the second part. Yeah. So it was, you know, I mean, this thing is a massive compound, huge walls, multiple layers of security. And, uh, I think off the top of my head, seven major cell blocks within each, each, well, one, it's like a big pinwheel. And then there's blocks, you know, on that. And then a couple other buildings that are their own cell blocks, um, off of that. But there was, it was just a treasure trove of information and no one would tap into it. I'm like, what? Like, why aren't we, why aren't we doing anything with this? These are all known bad guys who are in contact with other bad guys. We know that people are smuggling stuff in. We know that guards are bad. We know that um, they're, they're still talking to people, literally on their phones in prison. There, there was people running fucking operations out of prison. Out of prison. And it was, to some degree, smart. It's like, I'm safe. I can't get captured here. I'm already captured, but I can still kill Americans. Yeah. And <clears throat> so I was like, all right. Kind of in keeping with how I did things. Like, no one was doing it. Like, you're not supposed to go out there. Like, so most people would have a, a GRS detail if they were at, at base. Like, the standard, like a case officer, for example. You go somewhere. Typically speaking, you'd have a security detail. We, we did not. We were, our, we were allowed to do what, whatever we needed to do. And <clears throat> so I, I worked through at the time, Shafi, who lives with me now, um, to find a contact at this prison. They were not run by the umbrella Afghan organization that we trained and, and worked with. So they were outside of our scope. But I was like, oh, this, is, this is just going to be good. So I get in there. It was, it was a pain in the ass to get in there. And I literally just go and have tea with this guy. Tell him who we are. Here's, here's what we want to do. Could have, could have gone badly if, if he was on the take, you know. But it's like, you know what? Either we're going to get nothing or we're going to get something. So he was a cool guy. His name was Baki. Um, and eventually he got replaced, which, which we had to figure out how to get the new guy on board. But kind of promised, like, hey, like, I can try and, and I didn't know if I could, but, like, I can bring you some resources and some help. No one's really, I, I, that was like, is anyone really working with you? He was like, no. Like, Mill's not really, every once in a while they would, but not, like, on a sustained level. So it's like, is anyone working with you? No. Like, okay, well, what do you need? I need this. Let me work on getting that. Here's what I want in return. I want to have access to come out here, talk to people every once in a while, and, and help you kind of clean this place up. Which, of course, was not really the, the goal. I wanted to see who was in there. I wanted to see how things were functioning. I wanted to see what, what was going on there. So... We, um, I get, I get out there always was lots of resistance. Cause this was a big place. Their chain of command was intact, but also like you had a bunch of just douchebags who'd been there forever. Didn't like Westerners. Didn't, didn't like white faces coming in there and saying, Hey, you know, here's what, here's what I need you to do. But <clears throat> started talking to some of the people there, figuring out how things worked. I mean, this is, this is a place by the way, that at one point, I think it was cell block three. It might've been four. doesn't matter. The prisoner's took took the guards capture at one point and ran that block like it was just that back ass words yeah. like anything you'd think would make sense in this prison the opposite was true yeah so these guys were like scared of the prisoners and at one point get get detained by the prisoners and the prisoners run that block it's like you know i hold the conch or whatever the, what was yeah. that fucking book um, <laughs> um yeah. i know what you're talking okay. about okay anyways um that's going to drive me crazy. But um, so eventually it gets raided. You know, Afghan forces raid it. The thing, you know, is, is not completely destroyed, but it's, it's, for lack of better terms, destroyed. But there's all, there's just a treasure trove of people in there. So we st I start running with some of our colleagues and some of the Afghans. We start running intel in there. And we put some people in there, you know, as, as prisoners um, to get information and the stuff that you see coming out of there in terms of information, phone calls, the stuff that you see getting smuggled in, smuggled out, was just fascinating to the point where we'd be, you know, I, there's one day where I'm laying on the roof of this. There's like a bit, it's not a roof, but it's like a, had kind of like a Spanish tile topping to this big thick ass wall. And all these dudes are out in this like prison yard, like rec yard, just hanging out, you know on their recess or whatever you want to call it. And we knew this one guy was in there 
and he was responsible for a bunch of stuff going on in throughout the country. But we don't know who he is. We can't put a phone or you know, we just we just we, we were missing pieces to the puzzle. So we get Shafi actually is the one who called him. Lang and I have another American dude who's with me. We're la- laying in this dusty ass on top of this wall, just watching the prison yard, making a call. We knew he had a cell phone. So call him to find out who he is, and then we can and then we can work with the staff there to, you know, get a name, get some time with him, this, that, and the other. So we're laying in this prison, laying on this this roof, just watching, you know, call this guy, he picks up, then we know. Yeah. And it leads to more stuff. So we start doing all sorts of stuff like that. There's some other technological stuff that <clears throat> would give away capabilities, so I can't describe that. One time, I'll say this, though. One time, people started to catch on. Like, oh, this place is interesting back at base. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, like, of course it is. That's why we're checking it like, out. Like, why wouldn't it be? And <clears throat> they didn't like that we went out there because it was far and it was long for anyone to, to get to us if something went wrong. And obviously, you look back to, like, the very beginning of the war with Mike Spann and Things that happen there, obviously, you know, uprisings can happen there. It could go south fast. Yeah. So it's, you know, cost-benefit analysis. Like, all right. But one time we go out there, we get a whole host of data. Like, shit tons of data. Phone numbers, all this kind of stuff. Bring it back. They're excited. This is too much stuff, though. We can't, we don't have time to go through this. Like, what? Like literally, like this is this is these are the keys to the camp. You will break up multi. You will discover and eventually break up multiple cells Man. based on all this information here. We just don't have time. That's like yeah, I won the lottery. I just didn't have time to turn the ticket in, yeah. so I'm fucking broke. Oh my like, gosh, what? I remember we we were. I had brought um, some some you know more tech savvy guys with me to help get the stuff. And the amount of anger when they told us that, like they approved the op, yeah. they approved the op to go capture it all. And then we get back, oh, that's just too much. Dude, what the fuck? It's like, th- those are the moments there where it's like, I know I've got to get out of this at some point. I love yeah. what I do. I love who I do yeah. it with. But like, you guys are so fucking crazy yeah. and stupid. You're ruining it. That you're ruining it. Like yeah. we, we could be making <clears throat> significant progress here, but. Yeah. Um, wow. Dude, that is, that's wild, man. I mean, it, it's a seemingly brilliant and makes a lot of sense. Uh, surprising that it wasn't taken advantage more of. Yeah. Um, man, that's, that's fucking incredible. Um, I'm curious. I mean, did you ever get inside of that place? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I went in, I've been in every, what can you describe the conditions of what that fucking place is like? It's tattered. So there's, um, you know, it's I don't know, I I mean, inside gonna, an Afghani prison. Yeah. Like I was just going to say, it's exactly what you'd expect, but a lot of people probably don't think about those things. Yeah. It's, you know, dusty floors, dusty walls, and, a, and just, you know, lines of cells and cages. And a bunch of people who, you know, I'm walking down this one once, and the guard made me um, dump your weapon. It's like, you can't take the, you know, he's, I'm just strapped here. I don't have my M4. My other stuff's in the car. And I had another guy, as he's taking it, he didn't take it because I'm not going to give him his, my firearm. But, like, I give, I give my other guy this, and as I'm handing it to him, he's... Um, sticks a 26 down the back of my pants and covers it. So I've got something, <laughs> but I, you're walking down this thing. And these, these dudes, the way that they stare at you, the hatred they have for you is how are you looking next level? How are you? Are you looking back at them? Like, that's right. Motherfucker. Or oh, are you just kind of keeping your, Oh hell yeah. yeah. Like I want my presence to be known Yeah. and they don't know which one I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're, you're walking down. There. I mean, you just got to own it at that point. I mean, you go into a, you know, this, like yeah. you go overseas, you got, I've told my wife this, you got to play the part. You got to play the part. As soon as I would get on, you know, in the car, even to go to the airport, to, you know, to, to catch the bird, to go overseas. It's like, you got to flip a switch yeah. because you, the two worlds can't really yeah. exist together. No, it's, it's dicey. I mean, did that switch ever come on back home? I don't want to get too derailed, but, um, no, but I mean, I think it's like everyone else. Like it's, it you know, it's a struggle to, yeah. to keep keeping the the dormant monster dormant. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and it's just so different back here, and yeah. and and you can't get you know with, with the exception of stuff like this, like you can't get people to understand. Yeah. How how could they? I mean, who? Most yeah. people don't break into fucking <laughs> yeah, Afghan prisons. Prison. So like you know, how can they ever yeah. get to that spot yeah. in your head? Yeah. 
Um, I mean, my I've I've not been in an Afghan prison. My kind of mental imagery uh, of it would be almost. I mean, is it almost medieval? Like in in terms of being like old dungeness, you know, like Pirates of the Caribbean ride at fucking Disney World. I mean, is, is it like that, or is it more modern than you would expect? No, it's 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 closer to medieval, um, you know, but not not full on dungeon. I mean, there's there's parts that are dungeon like feeling, but it's 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 not sophisticated at all. I mean, you'd have you'd have some offices that were built like, and they were essentially like mud huts you know, built on the side perimeter of some of these things, a cheap, sorry, cheap metal building that the chief was in. Um, and then some guard quarters. And it just was an old, dusty, beat up, shitty old building. So I mean, that was multiple, multiple levels. So, I mean, it's, it's accurate to say then unlike American prisons where like everything's electronic and like you, you can yeah. unlock gates with a button and like there's none of that kind of shit. Like no. it's all no. physical manual. Over time, there, there was some stuff that was added and there was another prison um, that we did some work with that was like a smaller thing. And, you know, we added some stuff like that because um, we were in there. So we yeah. added some extra layers of security. But but out there, I mean, it's just like, yeah, it's, it's a third world prison. Did it's, it stink like fuck. Not as much as, I mean, it didn't smell good. Yeah. But, like, not as much as you would think. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I think you also get accustomed to it. I mean, like, the air you breathe in in that country in the first place is nasty. Yeah. We had a, we had a person come out, a scientist or whatever, come out and do it. And I don't know if this is still true, but it was at the time, and it, would, it makes sense, you know, because they burn everything. And they did a, a air sample survey. I don't know why we needed someone to come tell us we were breathing shitty air. Like we can, we can yeah. just tell you that and we'll save you the flight. Um, <laughs> but they said 30% of the air was fecal matter. Like there was a 30%, it registered 30% for fecal matter in the air Dude. floating around. So that's the good news Brutal. for us, right? Yeah. That's what we're breathing. Hey, shit breath. But it's but not you, my fault. You get used to that. <laughs> and I think it kind of, it's kind of like, you know, after, you know, going back to football days, after the game, you smell awful. But it's like you all do, so you yeah. kind of get used to the yeah, locker room like smell. So uh, the only time it would get rough is like you'd go into a meeting with an Afghan who didn't shower, didn't brush his teeth, didn't do any kind of personal hygiene, and maybe you'd gotten after a little bit the night before, and you're like, we've gone too far. We were we were, we were naughty boys last night, and I'm going to throw up all over you because I, I don't know if I can keep this down yeah. <laughs> with you smelling the way you smell. That bad, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know what they, what they eat in, uh, Afghan prisons? Like, are they fed properly or is it like, they get a lot of, um, <clears throat> you know, like rice and bread. Like, I mean, it's kind of typical. So like, um, they, they don't, they don't get taken good care of, obviously <laughs> it's an Afghan prison, but you know, their standard non some rice, maybe they get some meat sometimes. I don't remember if I ever saw meat, meat, but I know it's bad because we had, and I, this, we had some guys get put in there that shouldn't have been in there. And like people that we worked with, oh, okay. Afghans. Wow. Um, and everyone was flipping out. And I was like, well, I can, let me, I'll go try and help. Cause at least I can get in there. So this wasn't you guys planning them in there. This was, they got rolled up. They got rolled and they got put in there and they were getting treated like shit. Like, like everyone did, but particularly them because they knew you're working with America. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, would have to sneak stuff into them, get money to them so they could pay guards off to get them more stuff, get them blankets, get them stuff like that. Um, but you, you'd see the conditions because I, I got to talk to a, a, one of them um, yeah. a couple times, and it was not – I mean, it, it's again, it's what you'd expect in an Afghan yeah. prison. I know most of us don't sit around and think about what that yeah. looks like, but it's – But you can imagine. It's, it's not good. Yeah. Um, that's wild, man. Um, all right, so – Anything else from from your time there that uh, that can be shared that uh, that stands out as being memorable? Oh, man, any stories with our mutual friend that you can share? Oh, dude. Well, when we, you know, he brought me back in for the strike force thing. I actually, you know, you you try and get out because the leadership frustrates the piss out of you. You're, you know, I've got four kids, and obviously not all at the same time, but like. You're adding kids. You're you're gone six nine months a year. It's like at some point, like someone else has got to come. This it's got to be their job. I should go home. I also don't want to because, you know, you get that adrenaline rush. Yeah. It's fun. You got your teammates. You got that camaraderie that can not be replaced. Never will be replaced. So, but I I, I tried. I, I've tried multiple times, and I and I finally I succeeded. But like I I'm home. 
and I'm actually coaching a football team and kind of just take, taken, taken a beat. And I remember I'm at, I'm at this, this barbecue place, eating wings, playing trivia with some buddies. Um, <laughs> and I get a phone call and it's like, Hey, we're, we're standing this thing up. <clears throat> you need to come back over and describe it to me. I'm like, well, Fuck yeah, like, of course, I'm coming. You son of a bitch, I'm yeah. in. <laughs> I like, totally was like, sold, I'm there. And I was like, hey, they're, 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 you know, gloves are off a little bit. They're letting us do what we need to do. Yeah. And, of course, in his grid, yeah, brother, yeah. So, yeah like, like, all right, cool, I'm in. You know, oh, that's fucking tell weird. the wife, I walk in, tell my buddies, like, hey, man, I'm out. Like, I, I got, I'm yeah. going back over. Balloon went up. Um, so I, I, I go back over. It wasn't all... Perfect because, you know, of course, new leadership comes in. They try and put the cuffs back on you. We had to kind of fight against that. But I was so we're, so we're, um, he'll love this. We're, uh, we're hanging out. We've, we've kind of got like our own quarters for our team, um, of advisors that we've kind of, they liked to not give you that. They just want to kind of, you know, whoever's, whatever room's available, that's what you get. Whoever you're bunking with, that's what you get. We eventually like, just like we're here all the time. Can we get our own? Spot. So we finally got some people to play along with that, and it lasted for, for at least a while. But <clears throat> we're down there, and we've got our, uh, you know, our guys who do perimeter security for us at the compound, some of which are awesome dudes, several of which I know one, for example, who's one of my favorite dudes on the planet, ended up graduating from that and moving up to GRS, and, you know, he's doing all sorts of killer stuff all over the globe now. Um, you know, he just had to start where he had to start. And if you have less experience, that's kind of typically where they put you. So they're, there's, you know, they're kind of knowing their mindset jealous because they don't get to let their hair down as much as us. There's rules on, you know, drinking. There's rules on this, that, and the other. And again, they don't get to leave the base. They're just, yeah. you know, they see people going out and doing cool shit. They don't get to do it. So <clears throat> we're, we're, um, we did all sorts of operational stuff, but I'm going to tell this story about him because it, it has him without any pants on. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're drinking and did you uh, just drink a lot there? I yeah. Mean, yeah. Like, so, uh, I mean, we had, we had a bar there on our compound yeah. that was notorious for, you know, shenanigans. shenanigans. Yeah. I mean, also, I mean the, the amount of shit that happened in that bar, like that's, I, I think that would surprise a lot of people, even, even myself, you know, cause they were pretty, uh, closed hold on on our guys when we were there. Of I mean, course, like there's yeah. no, you really weren't drinking much. Or I mean, you know, there was guy we'd smuggle fucking vodka in and Listerine bottles and shit a, a little bit here or there, but it was really fucking dicey, you know. But it was also it was like you never knew when you may get called, get called. Well, you know, it, so. I mean, and, and you know, you're absolutely right, and, and that's how it is for most people. Whether you're soft, whether you're conventional, whether you're uh, whoever the fuck you are, like, but but the you're it's just this weird thing because we, we got to do cool stuff, leave the base every day, you know, be in harm's way. And then when you get back there, you're still in Afghanistan. Don't get me wrong, but we had a bar, we had like top shelf shit on there too. Yeah. And you know, we had good food. So we were spoiled in a lot of ways because the agents got a lot of money. Yeah. Like, so we would get, <laughs> we, we would get, um, we'd get comfortable at night and, and some nights more than others. There was, uh, we were told once, by the way, I'll get to the story about, about his, um, us going down the hallway, but we're, we're, we had been told that apparently we were bullying people, which is not true at all. We'd light a fire every night. We'd smoke cigars. We'd drink. We'd welcome anyone and everyone. We might come on to other men just to kind of <laughs> test them a little bit, but like, we, you're invited. Like you, you might get uncomfortable. Did you ever score? Uh, <laughs> I didn't score. Yeah. Um, man, thank God, because you know, you drink enough <laughs> at the night. There's probably some nights where it's like, oh, thank God. Like, I you know what? I'm going to roll with it. Yeah. But we would play rock band, and we had been – this new guy comes out. He was a construction guy. He just helped with construction for our Afghans. And he had been told, hey, check on these guys, because apparently they're kind of like ruling the roost too much and are not inclusive, and they're just kind of out of control. Like, well, I don't think that's uh, – to this day, I don't think that's true. Like, I think we were the most inclusive. We, we kind of – maybe the life of the party because we were there the most. We were just comfortable with the environment and kind of welcome people. Anyways, we're playing rock band, which is kind of, you know, whatever. Don't judge me. But we're, we're playing rock band. But we, he, this guy comes in. It's a double door into the room where we're playing rock band. And people, we got loud. Like, we didn't, we didn't do it on low volume. 
we'd have people sit in there and fucking watch us play rock band. Like there was like a, like groupies, not that we were good just because I think, you know, it was just somewhere to drink and hang out. So we're in there doing it. This dude who's told to, Hey, check on these guys and report back to, to headquarters. He gets off the plane. Don't know him from Adam. I remember this dude, he, he walks in, opens the double doors and quickly closes them and walks away. <laughs> because in there, we have a smoke machine. We have IR strobes going off. <laughs> People are like, there's like, I mean, it, it was like a scene from a movie, like liquor being poured out of bottles onto people. It just was, it was, it was, yeah. you know. Was it all dudes? There were some girls watching, but oh, like okay. it was, it was all dudes playing. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't just 16 fucking. No, it wasn't all, it, you know, no, you, sword we, fight. No, there's no sword fight. I mean, we had, you know, we had, we had legitimate fans. We should have yeah. gotten like some merchant ship, but like, so he walks out. Thankfully he's a reasonable dude. He's, he's a great friend now, but talk to him at breakfast the next morning, which is remarkable that any of us even made it yeah. to. Um, and he was like, you know, I was told to, um, check on you guys and, and you kind of lived up to everything <laughs> that we were told, but he was like, I'm not saying shit like, you know, and it went on. But then, so fast forward, everyone in the audience is like, these guys just drink, they don't do anything. And it's probably, it's probably, you know, again, not smart, but you've got so much stress in that environment and there's yeah. always things going on. So you, you sometimes let your hair down more than you should. And we're, we're, I don't know what had happened. We we're drinking, and all of a sudden, as, as the night's closed, you got one of these security guys down the hall. His door's open. I don't know why his door to his, his room was open. But our mutual buddy and I thought it would be a good idea to go running down the hall naked with our nods on. And this dude, this dude comes out and just stares at us and just kind of watches us go. And then retreats back into his room like nothing ever happened and we were, we were we were the theme of golf we were playing golf in the hallway um but uh, that was that was a great night and he's got you know he, anyways it, it was it was it was um, it's a classic him thing it's a classic him like it seemed like a good idea at the time like yeah. not yeah i mean there's a million fucking stories i have of that guy i mean he's you know one i mean one of the one of the best men i've ever met yeah, one of the best men I know, and uh, I mean, I, I couldn't say enough good things about him. He's just a hell hell of a guy. But he'll do anything for you. Yeah, yep. he'll do anything for you. And and uh, he, he's he's in t he's one of those guys who's really intense. Part of it's just because of his rough gruff voice. Yeah. But like, so if you don't know him, he can he can be off putting. But it's like the dude, the dude will do anything. Yeah, for he's, you. he's and, as good a guy as yeah. exists. You know, yeah. no, no two ways about it. Um, is there anything throughout your entire career? Is there a a thing that you're most proud of that you were able to accomplish? Like whether it's a specific mission or uh, a capability that you provided for, you know, whatever, like, is there, what was the first thing that comes to mind? Say, what are you the most proud of? Man, I don't know. You know, I mean, it, cause you're in that community, no one knows who you are, what you do. And, and it's weird coming from the sports world to that because there's, it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. There's act, accolades, there's praise, and you come in and you kind of just because you're wired that way kind of want it and then you eventually you know you're just like whatever like we get to do cool shit no one knows what we do and that's that's fine it is what it is um i don't know i don't i don't feel like there's one thing i feel like i stuck to my principles and sometimes it took me out of out of following all the the rules and roads exactly the way it was but it was you know i i feel like and not just me, but like, you know, the guys I worked with, like, I feel like we did what we were told and trained to do. Um, yeah. And we're consistent with it. And, you know, to spend that much time, which a lot of people did, you know, I've, we all have buddies who have spent a ton of time over there. But I, I feel like, you know, learning all those skills from coming in that first dude, you know, that first time, green as hell, not knowing you know, anything other than the fact that I, I want to do this, I'm glad I'm getting to do this. It's not all going perfectly to start and then to just finish and have deployed the number of times that I did and eventually finish. I finished in, in Iraq with the whole ISIS thing. Um, you know, t it's just like, you know, I, even though no one else knows what we did, I feel good about what we did, I guess. It's not yeah. it's not a personal thing. It's just like we did good. Yeah. Like, well, so in, in that same kind of vein, is, is there 
a thing or, or anything that stands out as being the most successful, like the holy shit, I can't believe we pulled that off. Um, like, was there any Game 7 World Series Grand Slams? The big mish? I mean, I feel like... I feel like there was lots of home runs. I don't know if there was any walk-off home runs. You know, there's a couple big HVTs we took down that felt really good. There's the, you know, kind of ones where you're like, oh, I want to call home and, and tell someone about this. And all you can do is, like, we did something good today, you know. Um, and, and are those you still can't talk about? Yeah. yeah. I mean, for the most part, yeah. Um, just because of the, the, you know, sources and methods yeah. and how we, how we got it done. Um, you know, the one HVT I told you about earlier where we kind of broke the rules to go about and get that done – you know, that one felt really good because um, I knew it. Like, I knew this was going to be good or had a high probability of being good. And, you know, we had to get creative in how we got it done, but, yeah. it, but we got it done, and and that felt really good. Um, we, you know, we we took down a lot of people, mostly with airstrikes in, in Iraq. But, um, you know, when the whole ISIS thing started, um, very different kind of unit but stood up a Iraqi unit there, um, trained them. They got really capable. I mean, we, we killed a lot of dudes, um, and that, that felt really good. Because um, these were all the really rough ISIS guys. Rough, rough ISIS guys, and we were taking money. We were, we were going hardcore after their money. Um, and we, I mean, we, you know, again, mostly with airstrikes in this case, but we smoked well over 100, um, and depleted lots of money um you know there's lots of articles that were written in the mainstream media like this whole thing went up and this whole thing's gone and this infrastructure's gone like that was the guys that we like they they got some good stuff done so that felt really good and then i I would say too getting and we can talk about it later and not talk about later it's it's fine but um getting shafi my terp in afghanistan my my favorite terp i had lots of terps um getting him out in the end yeah was an epic story and a big home run because it's tricky when you work in intel it's tricky for anyone trying to get out of there but you know we've tried to help people for a long time mill has a apparatus to kind of do that through their whatever it's called their you know their translator thing um we can't prove they exist because we can't you know we don't have documentation like other people and so you can't be like okay well i need proof of service and proof of what you did and your exact title and your exact location. It's like, well, I can't give you any of that. So how, I mean, can we still do this? And they're like, no, like, okay. So, um, so that was, yeah, I I definitely, definitely want to get the full, full story on getting the turp out right before we get to that though. I am curious when you're talking about dismantling the financial networks of ISIS, is that something as simple as freezing accounts or is it physical cash is it both like like what constitutes or or is involved in a financial infrastructure in a terrorist organization that way so you know obviously it could be a lot of things depending on but specific to them there were people who who worked with like treasury and stuff like that who um would go after not just isis but a lot of groups and and try and freeze and you know do it that way through the banking route but a lot of these jokers will have you know big storage places where they've got stacks of cash. Is it usually American? I think, I mean, most of the time, I feel like most of the time we did, I can think of one instance where we were watching the feed and you can't, well, you can't tell in the, you know, the uh, feed, like, but you can see, we were told it was, you know, like a room full of dollars and you could see after the place was hit, the dollars just oh, shit. floating down. You know, oh. again, you can't when you're watching the the feed there, you can't see like, well, is that a is that dinar or is that? But like, yeah. Um, but they had they had lots of physical money. physical money, which you know maybe the Taliban Al Qaeda did before too. I just never focused on that. But this are we were tasked with that, and um, we we're able to get a lot of good actionable intel and you know, send people into their territory, confirm it, and then strike it. And so in, in most cases, when it was physical money, it was destroyed. Destroyed, yeah. Wow. Like, I forget the count, but it was... Like hundreds of millions? Hundreds of millions. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i curious, like, if that is dollars, I mean, isn't there a certain element of when you're destroying that volume of currency that at a point could upset, like, from an inflation standpoint, or like, like could 
kind of upset or tip the balance of, of what money's actually worth? I don't know. Cause that, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I mean it's one it, like a few thousand, a couple hundred thousand, you know, right. when you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars, I mean, that's pretty fucking significant. But it's, it's, it's also like, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, know the answer. I mean, but I, like, it's, it's like dark money. So like, is it like really accounted for anywhere? You know, is it, is it? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how they keep track of it. Right. I mean, they know what they've printed, but right. they don't know what's been destroyed or what's, what's circulating, you know? So right. I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't either. But, I just was, I was told to, to get rid of it and yeah. we got rid of it. I don't, you know. Sometimes it was, you got rid of it and brought it home with you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did I you ever you, run? The amount of money, I mean, I, you know, being an Intel officer, you'll pass money a lot. Yeah. And some, like, like I, the, the most I've passed in one sitting, like shoving across the table is just over three mil. Holy fuck. To see that stacked there and to have access to that kind of money a lot, like never did, I promise. But like, there's times where it's like, okay, well, if I took this, if we took this, like, where do we go? Like, what's, what's our, yeah. like, we're not going back, but like you, you encounter so much money because the amount of money that the agency, JSOC, you know, all these people throw around, it's insane. Dude, three million? I three mean, million. physically, volume-wise, what, what is that? It was probably, I mean, obviously it depends on the, if it's in hundreds. Yeah, but like it, it was it was probably I don't, I don't think people can see the, this table, but like it was probably if to, it's it filled that table. A regular suitcase. How many regular suitcases would it be? It was one it was one big one. Okay. It was one big one and then it was put out there that they, you know, I don't think they um if it was smaller amounts, sometimes they'd put it through the, you know, the money counter, counter but like that would have taken fucking 3 million. 3 million. Dollars. Dollars. Yeah. Can you say what it was for? It was training and equipment. Holy fuck, man. I mean, do you know, have you kept track even loosely of how much money you've handed over over the 15 year span? I mean, no, is it, it's a lot. I, I think it's a hundred million. Mm, involved in a hundred million. Yes. But like directly me only. No, not, yeah. not me only. Cause you know, a lot of those are, are joint, joint yeah. efforts and, and there's different components going into it, but definitely over the course of time. Yes. hundred million. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, government, like how it's like, you know, yeah. If you don't spend it, you lose it, right? Yeah. Um, I got called in once. A couple of us did. It wasn't just me. We got called in. It was mid-evening, 8, 9, local, something like that. Program chief, like, hey, it's um, use it or lose it time, and we don't want to lose this line item. I need you. Can you spend a million dollars? Like, yeah, like I'm, I'm pretty good at spending. Everybody's money. getting new boots. Yeah, and I was like, "Well, by when?" He was like, "Tomorrow." <laughs> like, okay, like this seems irresponsible. Uh, if I'm just being honest, just just go blow a million dollars in the next twelve hours or so, just 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 so Dude, we can bad. say we did. Like, um, what did you spend it on? Tons of gear for guys that we were. Um, we were getting, um, and then there's this one piece of equipment that we got. Again, we're just blowing money at this yeah. point. Like, it, the, the, what was the, the most ridiculous? The purpose. So we we got, um, and our buddy, we were working on this thing. We <laughs> we had a side task that we were starting to work on and stand up, and never went through. Um, and it's probably good because it would have it was like this joint coordination center among Afghans, and like we we as Americans can't even get you know things coordinated. So how we can't expect them to do. It. But we got this big ticket item projector for this op center. And anyone who's worked with me knows exactly what we're talking about because it became a debacle. Um, our job was to purchase it and then get it delivered. This thing got lost in transit, <laughs> never got there. Uh, no one would, could ever get answers. Obviously, you're trying to get you know the agency and an and Afghan and this third party thing. Yeah, but it's like a projector that like NASA uses. Uh, how much was it? Hundreds, hundreds of thousands. Yeah, Jesus. And um, it was going to be badass. We never got to use it because it never got there, and we stopped working on that project. And and did it finally show up? No, ever? no. So it's just lost. It's just lost. So you guys spent a couple hundred grand on something that never even fucking panned out. Correct. Jesus Christ. I mean, it reminds me of you know, like at at the end of my first deployment. It was a, a cruise, a ship cruise. And so you know we had all of this allocated ammunition to take on deployment. Right. And the process of when you come back from deployment, that ammunition, if, if it has not been used, checking it back in is is such a pain in the dick that most guys 
shoot what they can. Like we would go on the fantail and just have several range days where we would burn through as much of it as we could. I mean, putting it to as good a use as we could. Right. But then it got to the point where there was so much of it that it was just thrown over the fucking side. <laughs> And I want you to think about that, especially now with how expensive it's gotten. Right. And, and this, granted, keep in mind, this is the late 90s, early 2000s, is prior to 9-11 even. But, you know, that that's the state of the inefficiencies and the ridiculousness of the government of thousands of 45, 9 mil, 556, 308, literally at the bottom of the fucking ocean. Yeah. I mean, it's no, just... No, it, it is the most ineffective, inefficient yeah. machine out there. And it, it's what's crazy is is the, the top-tier people who work in the government, the top-tier units, not the top echelon, the brass are the, the, the problem usually. But, you know, the people you worked with, the people I work like, there's amazing stuff that gets done that needs to get done, but it kind of stops there. Everything else is just a shit show. But, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of like it reminds me of having kids. Like, I know it may sound like a stretch to the listener. Bear with me for a second. It's like, you know, having kids is some of the most amazing things you've ever experienced in the world and also some of the shittiest. Oh, yeah. You know, some of the funniest and some of the saddest. You know, it's like the, the two polar opposite extremes that exist is is similar that way and that, like, some of the most amazing shit you've ever been a part of and some of the dumbest, most ridiculous shit that you, like, you can't even, like, you couldn't have even thought of doing something that ridiculous right. uh, that, that now you're a part of. I mean, I remember I was like, dude, I'll I'll take it. Like, can, can we take it? Nope, you can't take it. It's fucking, it's considered theft. And, you know, like you can get brought up on UCM. So I can't take this ammo and shoot it. I have to throw it off the fucking side. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Holy shit. Like it still pisses me off. Yeah. Like, uh, anyway. No, it's all, all the spending is, is ridiculous. Yeah. It's absurd. Uh, tell us about, uh, kind of how, how that whole all panned out with the, abortion of the uh, evacuation of of uh, afghanistan and kind of that how, how the whole process worked yeah well um crazy story and i know a lot of other people have crazy stories with it too you know it's and and not to go down that road but man i mean first and foremost when it happened i was devastated pissed angry you know the amount of time that all of us have spent there um you know, first I had to get over that. And then you get over it and like, oh shit, like, what about this guy? What about that guy? What about all these people we've worked with? Because again, on the Intel side, it's harder to vouch for them. There's not really a process. Um, and granted it was mayhem at the end and people who didn't even work with the government obviously came out too, but getting to the airport and giving yourself even a shot, if you're an Afghan of getting taken out of the country was, you know, you're, you're playing Russian roulette. It's just like, it's, it's a total odds game. But um, so I had worked with Shafi for the longest time. He was kind of my first one ever, uh, first interpreter ever. Spent several years with him. And then he, you know, and this is a guy who, you know, again, I didn't always follow all the rules. Um, and he, as such, didn't follow all the rules either because he was attached to my hip. So he's a guy that... <laughs> Ended up at the very end, if the the shit show that occurred hadn't occurred, he would have been a general. Um, so he ended up making it through. But throughout his experience, there's a couple times where he went down um, because if if one of the Afghan members of the leadership in his service didn't get paid a lot of attention to by the Americans, they were butthurt and pissed off at anyone who did seem like they were helpful. And our goal was always, Hey, we want to help you guys out and to make you and your collective service better. So don't, don't get your feelings hurt that we're putting a lot of stock into this person. Cause this person is yours. It's not, they're not ours. They're going to make your service better. Anyways, he's a guy who just, he's like a loyal bulldog. You tell him, Hey, go do this. He says, and he literally says it. Yes, sir. And, and he goes and I mean, I, it, you could say, you know, go kill everyone in that car. And it'll be like, all right, like he's that's just kind of the, the the dude that he is and um servant's heart good dude you know so we go we have our ups and downs we did a lot of stuff if, if i ever had something kind of off book or crazy to do he was the guy I called because I, I knew i could <laughs> trust him so <clears throat> eventually he moves on to a different position first he gets demoted then i bring him back we justify the leadership why he needs to be back no you can't work with americans anymore we don't trust you they're trying to turn you like we're we're working in the open with him. Like we're not trying to turn him. Like you can, you can see what's happening here. Anyways, then he's back. And so it's kind of this back and forth, a roller coaster ride. Eventually he starts climbing. And this is a dude who is just a warrior. 
Um, he was a, he was basically my equivalent on their side, who also would provide translation services for me. So he would operate with us as well, but you know he could he could speak moderately well English. So so this is a guy who had gone through it all. You know, was targeted a lot because he was an Afghan who worked with Americans closely and and special Americans. So he was targeted a lot, was attacked a lot all the time. His family was killed by the Taliban for his role. Damn. Um, they tried to get him at home, blew up his two kids in the front yard. His wife later died from the same a- attack. Holy He's been shit. in the hospital for, he got attacked another time, <clears throat> um, tried to, to um, get him with an IED and while well, he was in his vehicle and survived it. Broke his hip, his fingers were split, his head almost. I mean, I mean, the scars, his face was burnt to, to shit. Like, I mean, just the this, this stuff you see. He was, he, was, he was in a, you know, whatever they're called, the cat, like basically the full body cast for wow. almost a year. Couldn't work. Went back to work because he cares about his country. Had another incident like that where he was in the hospital for six months. You know, just kept getting targeted because he was doing the right thing. They didn't like it. Um, and again, lost lost it all, um, kept going because that's who he is. So he ends up going through all these things. We could talk about the gazillion times that he was attacked or blown up. Um, but he gets that. I stayed in touch with him, which we're not supposed to do, right? You're supposed to draw that line. But you spend all this time with these people, and, and you, you do. You get – there's emotional connections that happen. Is that like an agency directive? Like could you get in trouble clearance-wise by doing that? I could have, but what we talked about wasn't really what you're not. It's it's kind of broad language. You're not supposed to have close and continuing contact, but you know at the same time, I was still operational with him. And then when I was done, I was done. So it's like, who cares? You know, who, who, who? Yeah. So don't you can't tell me that I'm not, I can't Skype this guy and say yeah. how are you? Yeah. You know, are you okay? Are you safe? Um, so we would do that every once in a while. It's a guy I remember once some. Um, at our house in, in Florida with my wife, and, and he had made me food at his house once. I mean, I'd been to his house multiple times for dinners, met his, his family, and I'm like, oh, man, how did he make that? So we call him, Skype him. He's telling us over Skype how to make it, and we're, we're making this food. And he would always want, like all the guys we worked with, he would always want to, to go to America. Like, I want out of here. Like, I'm going to fight for my country. I love my country, but this doesn't end well for anyone. Yeah. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm trying. And I have tried. Like, I had talked to, especially when I was out, talked to attorneys, talked to people like, hey, here's the deal, man. Can, can, we, can we just even adopt this guy? Like, I know he's a year older than me. I know it's kind of weird to adopt a man who's older than you, but, like, is it po- like, what can we do to try and get him out? Because he's seen as an intel officer, so our government's going to say, A, there's no paperwork, and B, he could be a threat. You know, we don't just let other spies in. It's like, you know. So the answer was always basically no. Sorry. Just send him to the border. He can walk right Exactly. That, I, I would tell him that. Like, man, just all you got to do is get to Mexico. I'll pay to get you there. Yeah. And then tell them you want to come here. They'll fly your ass to Florida, too. Yeah, Put no you shit. up in a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> like in 2022. But um, so, so all this happens and um, never could get it done. Never could get it done. Wanted to help him. I just didn't have the means to do it. And the, the silver lining to the you know, absolute shit show and embarrassment that was the withdrawal, which I still think, at least in our lifetimes, the biggest international blunder, if, if not ever, um, is there was chaos. And it, it forced the hand of a lot of those guys to shit or get off the pot and they got over here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it, and it, op, you know, you know, when you first get into a war um, early on, the rules are kind of different. It's kind of the same at the end Like in this case, like it's just on steroids, like whatever, you know, people are trying to tell you what you can and cannot do, but people are going to do the right thing. So I'm calling him and I talked to him. He, at this time he's at, in Helmand over on the Western side and he's running this huge thing. We'd had, well, our strike force who we had trained and operated with had just gotten smoked in Kandahar because they went Winchester. No one was supporting them anymore. You know, everyone keeps saying, well, they laid down their arms and everyone just quit and let them come in. It's like, no. The government and the palace worked a deal and stopped supplying them, and and people people fought till the end. But if you don't have you know ammo and, and weapons and food, like you can't can't sustain it. So, <clears throat> but you know we're hearing stories of our guys getting killed everywhere, which is obviously 
not easy to deal with. So you're pissed about this. You're hearing people getting killed left and right. And I call Shafi and I finally get a hold of him. And of course, being the guy that he is, he's, you know, no big deal. It's okay. Like all my friends are dying and I'm on the run. It'll be okay. How are you? How's your family? Sure. Good. Like, uh, how about we focus on you this time? I know you like to focus on me, but like, let's. So they were in Helmand. They had run out, run out of everything. Taliban, they were, they were at a, um, this compound. Taliban had them circled. They, they killed a lot of dudes. He sent me the pictures. They, they killed a lot of dudes. They literally were stacking bodies. Had no, no support, but everything was closing in. They got to the point where they had to make a run for it. So they make a run. <clears throat> get out of that incursion and long story short he goes on foot from Helmand to Kabul which is how far doesn't have a vehicle I don't know how many it's far <laughs> I mean it's like hundreds of miles <laughs> I mean it's yeah it's I mean I'm sure he you know hitched a ride, hitched a ride whatever, at points yeah. and something like that but he had no vehicles left they had destroyed them all with yeah with uh explosives and whatnot so he gets he gets you know he on foot slash hitchhike whatever to Kabul, where he's from. The Taliban, meanwhile, who've, again, attacked him multiple times, killed his family, all this kind of stuff, are calling him saying, you know, we're coming for you. Like, we're going to kill you. So he can't go home. He can't go home. He doesn't have a lot of his paperwork and IDs because they are at home. He doesn't have a passport that's active and valid like a lot of them do because they never have been able to leave. So... He's got nothing. He's on the run and he's sleeping. I'm talking to him every day, multiple times. And he's sleeping in under construction homes that aren't built yet. No one's living in and changing locations every night as these people are hunting him. You know, people had gone to his house. They arrested his father and one of his brothers. So all the worst is happening. And it's just, I mean, it's getting worse, right? You just, you can, we all saw it on the news. He has no money. He has no nothing. He's just on the fly. I'm like, shit, like, what do I do? Like, I'm not in. I, if I was there, we'd, we'd figure something out. I'm not there. I don't have access to a classified system anymore. I can't get on and be like, hey, go get this guy. And it was such chaos at the airport that even people who had the right documentation, which none of our people did because of them being working with Intel, but the, even the people who did, we're having trouble getting in because of just the crowds, the, the danger. We are all of a sudden fucking sharing in, intel with the Taliban, the people we've been fighting for the last 20 years. So they know who they are. Oh, they've been told to let them through. Like, yeah, that's yeah, okay. That's going to work. Um, so it's almost impossible. It's like, dude, we're running out. I don't, I don't know what to do. You might have to just make a run and try and get to a soldier and explain what you did and just hope and pray that... You know, they have a soft heart and let you through um, or give you a chance to explain yourself. But again, that's when the, the, the explosion happened. We're at the last day and I get a hold of one guy in the building who like, hey, who do we do we have anyone? Is anyone even there like or of our people left? Because it was the you know, last hour, last 24 hours. And he or, you know, it was probably 48 hours at that point. But, but then by the time it happened, um, <clears throat> so he gets me in touch with one of our paramilitary guys who's on the ground over there. Well, he gets in touch with them first, explains the situation. Hey, like, this is a guy who worked with us forever. Like, he's a good dude. He's one of ours. He has nothing. He has no paperwork. He has no, no nothing. He can't get to the gate. What do we do? Like, he's like, hey, I, I put it out there. I explained it. They're kicking it around or whatever. I get... The last night, it was August 26th, I believe it was, um, I get a, a, a call at like 3 a.m. in the morning, or a text, rather. I get a, a, a signal message. And I, I, when I sleep, I'm out. So the fact that I even heard this thing was, is, is miracle one. But I hear this thing, and it just says, Drew, get up. <clears throat> and I'm like, okay, I'm up. Type it back. And then I get some instructions he needs to get to this place that has this kind of a sign in this part of town and he needs to get get there fast you know just some instructions we gave him some you know this person's going to say they're this person you say you're this person um just kind of like some verbal protocols so i get that then i try and call shafi well shafi's not using a cell phone which he shouldn't because they've now taken over 
the SIGINT department that we trained and funded and equipped and all this, that, and the other. And they're actively going through files, trying to find people, tracking their this, that, and the other. So he's, he's being a good intel officer, being smart, not using that, just using it on Wi-Fi. So he's, he's hard to get a hold of, and then he's trying to be quiet in certain spots that he's in, too. So I, he doesn't answer at first. I'm like, well, this is, you, you need to answer the fucking phone. Like, I, like, we've got your lifeline right here, and we've got hours left until these people get on their own plane and go. So <clears throat> finally get a hold of him. Do you know where this place is? Yes, I do. Can you get there? It's going to be tough. Like, it's going to take a while because I got to go, you know, surreptitially, you know, you know what I'm trying to say, through, you know, got to go back roads. I can't go on the main roads because the Taliban have checkpoints everywhere. So he gets there. <clears throat> and and there's there's a lot of this story, too, that I've, I've for the sake of time, I've skipped, you know, trying to get paperwork done before all this. My wife and I are there trying to forge a signature because he doesn't have access to a printer or a scanner to try and submit this. And the process didn't work anyways. But we you fast forward to this part. They've given him a place to go. They were not supposed to do this. Thank God they did. Giving him a place to go. I finally get a hold of him. He, he figures out a way to get there, but he does not have the ability to get to his house, get any kind of identification or anything. So he's, it's literally just him, the clothes on his back. And, and then it just, it's dark for a while. It's dark. It's quiet. It's my, my uh, youngest daughter's birthday the next day. And we get a call early in the morning I get a call from our guys on base and like, we got him. He's here. So I talked to him, you know, it was awesome. Good. You know, everyone's excited. Where, where uh, which base? He was, he was at uh, the end of the airport oh, I gotcha. in Kabul um, where we might've had some people. Um, so he's secure on that end of the compound back on base and safe. I'm like, Hey, okay. So I'm talking to our guy. What, what's the, he's like, Hey, he's just, he's going to chill here. We'll get him on a flight. He should be leaving today. Um, all right, cool. Sounds good. Keep me posted. Um, thanks for, you know, thanks for doing this. And uh, again, major kudos to them because they've been told not to do this. But for our guys who worked and trained with us all the time, you know, the people who, who do this mission right, no matter what some dude in a tie says, you say don't do this, they're going to they're gonna fucking do it. Like, the right thing is this, I'm doing it. Um, so they did it, and it was, it was awesome. But so... So we're excited. We're celebrating <clears throat> at our house because we've all put a ton of, you know, emotions into this and seems like things are going well. And I get a call. Shafi calls. Hey, sir. Um, I'm at, well, first he called and said, I'm, I'm waiting on, with a group of people at, 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 on the tarmac to get on a plane. And then he calls back and, hey, sir, they won't let me on. Like, What? What are you talking about? Give me the, give, who, who won't let you on? This, this soldier won't let me on. I said, give him the fucking phone. Let me talk to him. He's like, hey, sir, he, they would like to talk to you. You know, I said, tell him, tell him where I worked um, and, and, and this, that, and the other. Like, just, just let me ex explain how we've gotten to this point. And he's like, he doesn't have paperwork. He doesn't have this. He doesn't have a passport. He's not getting on the plane. I'm like, you, you don't understand, bro. Just, just let the dude on the plane. He wouldn't be here if he didn't belong here. Um, he's like, no, I can hear him in the background. I'm like, no, I ain't talking to no one. Like, okay. I'm like, stand by. I'm going to try and get a hold of our other guy. So don't you leave the base. No matter what they tell you, you do not leave that base. Because I knew how hard it was to get there in the first place. So I call, I try and get a hold of our guy at the opposite end of the airport. He's not answered. He's probably out helping someone else. Shit. Finally, I get in touch with them. I'm like, dude, here's what's happening. They, they're not letting him on the plane. He's like, what, motherfucker? He's like, you hang on. I'll call you back. <laughs> he goes down there. And I don't know how long it was. All that time, you know, just felt like forever. Um, but it was certainly the better part of an hour or so. And I'm just like, man, I hope this goes well. Like, usually... We get to play the trump card a lot in those those war zones. You have those three letters. You can you can you can get away with a lot. And Shafi sends a picture on the plane, which look not the way you want to fly if you're leaving. <laughs> but I, I mean, you're leaving. But man, they're all crammed in there. So I call down to I called back to um, I couldn't get a hold of the guy. Wanted to thank him again. Couldn't get a hold of him uh, at least that day. And 
So I called uh, my buddy who put me in touch with him, who's in the building. And I was like, hey, man, what happened? He was like, all he would tell me is that it was not pretty, <laughs> but that he is on the plane. He, he went down there and took care of business and got him on. Man. Um, so he you know, went through the whole process, went, went to um, Kuwait, and then came back to Dulles. We got him bumped ahead in the line. He went to Camp Atterbury. He was there for... I don't know, shit, seven weeks, something like that. And then we got him back home, and, and uh, he's been living with us for about a year. And How's doing, that going? Is it, it weird? It's, it's weird. You know, you, you have the honeymoon phase where you're so excited. Yeah, everything's cool. And everything's you can do cool. No wrong. And, then, and then, you know, it's, it's taxing because yeah. you've got a grown-ass man living in your house. I've, we've given up a room for him. Um, so it's, it's tricky, and he's, he's having to learn – how to be an American. How to be an American, what the process is, what we do, what we don't do. Like we'd have a, you know, contractor come to the house or something to work and he's just a protective person, which is great. It's, it's nice having that because it's like if anyone comes to our house, like you've got not just dad to go through, like you've got our Afghan here who will yeah. just kill you on site. Like, <laughs> so, so it's nice for security, but he, he'd just like sit there and watch workers like right over their shoulder, watch them work. I'm like, hey, bro, come here. you can't. <laughs> Just let them do their thing. You can't yeah. just, you know, so there's all these things and you're, I'm learning immigration stuff because we're having to go through that, like to try and get him asylum and this, that, and the other. He just had his interview and, and hopefully that went well. And, you know, trying to get him his bank account set up and all that stuff, which most of which is done, but it's just, you're, you're essentially f like fostering a child or adopting yeah. a child and, and raising another kid, even though he's a year older than me. And there's lots of disconnect still. Um, so it is all I'd say it's going well. Like we have fun. We took him on a family vacation with us this year and, and, you know, went down to Marco Island and boated and fished and had a great time and he loved it. So he loves the kids. He, you know, everyone gets along great, but you know, at a certain point we'll get to, you know, I was talking to someone like, well, when's he going to leave? I'm like, well, I, I don't know. We haven't put a timeline on it, but yeah. like, just when it makes sense, when it makes sense, when it makes sense for him and for us, like we want to get that to that point so we can have our space back. He'll still be a part of our family, but you know, your kids, someone was like, your kids go to college and leave too, you know, yeah. like, that's a good point. You're yeah. right. Yeah. Like it can't be endless. Yeah. Um, you know, he'll still come to family functions and whatnot, but so it's going well, but it's, it was crazy getting him here. It's been awesome having him here and, and, uh, we'll see, I don't know. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. Has there been any like, uh, weird cultural moments where it's like, dude, you got to have pants on or like some, something <laughs> fucking weird like that. Not thankfully not the pants thing. You know, he's pretty modest, but you know, you have conversations like I'll, I'll be like talking to my wife, like, man, I just had to sit him down and explain to him how to put deodorant on. Yeah. You know, he's a 43 year old man and, and he um, smells like a raccoon. He asshole. smells like a raccoon. I mean, like, and, and men are prideful, right? We all are. And we're like, it's not easy to have that conversation. Like, hey, hey, man, you, you, um, you fucking stink. You smell like ass. Like, <laughs> like I'm gonna throw up. And he he does some some work for us with some of the different companies we have. It's like you can't do that. You you can't be working, and sm one you just can't smell like this. But yeah. but two you can't be working and smelling. Like, there's just standards here. Yeah. He's like, I was like, do you understand? Oh yes, I I very much understand how this works. I like, but, but like. But he doesn't really get it. He doesn't really get it. And I had him. I was like, okay, walk me through, walk me through how you how you clean yourself, <laughs> like, and you you finally get there, and it's like, you have the deodorant. Like he, he would, he has like spray deodorant. Like he'd spray it on his clothes, and he'd spray it on the ground, you know, like where he prays and stuff. I'm like, no, 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 no. Goes on you. It goes on you, and it goes under here. And you're an older man, by the way. As we get older, we smell like ass. That's just that just happens, man. Yeah. So. You know, things like that are, yeah, are that's funny. you know, the, 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 the conversations that you, you expect to have with your children at a certain point you're having yeah. with a, a 43 year old guy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. That's uh that's amazing that you were able to get them out under those circumstances. It sounds like it was so, you know, hit or miss or like, you know, it almost went horribly wrong and it was yeah. like, you know, yeah. And our guys left right knew. after that. I mean, yeah. literally they, they were gone. Like that was like <laughs> wild. The thirteenth hour. Yeah, wild. Um, so, in, for you, I guess, like, what now? Uh, so, what, what year did you leave there, and, and what have you been doing since? So, I got out the end of sixteen ish. Um, you know, went from there, went from uh, Afghanistan to Iraq. We talked about, did that part for a little bit, um, and then came back. Wanted to get out. You know, 
never in a million years that I think I'd get into digital media. Like I've, I've lived this life of like secrecy and, and whatnot. And, and then you go and do the exact, do the exact opposite. So it's, it was weird. Like I always joke when I speak places, like I made that natural transition of going from being a spy to, you know, hosting a show and, you know, but like, (laughs) but I had done some commentary, um, afterwards, just some, some basic, national security commentary would go on Fox or whatever and talk about terrorism or, you know, a lot of, you know, there's sadly a lot of active shooter situations going on then like, Hey, what, you know, what are your, everyone's got their own two cents, but they're gen, you know, there's more general, general points that you talk about when you're in those types of situations. So they'd bring me on for that. And I, I saw that the people that they would use for some of these things, and there's a, the perfect example. And I know this guy that I'm referring to here. I won't say his name. He's been on my show a couple of times. Great guy, but he's a fiction author who's never served, never done anything, but he writes great books, military, espionage, counterterrorism kind of stuff. And I would see him go on and they would ask him questions on real world. As though he was a, as though he was an expert. I'm like that. Hold on now. Like you've got fiction authors now coming on as your expert. Like we, we can do better. And I'm not even saying me, like we can just collectively as a, as a place is a world do better. So we, I got into digital media and we were working with a bunch of folks and we were focused on bringing in people who had real experience to comment on, you know, stuff, you know, like you actually been there, done that, got the t-shirt. So the, the thought was going to do a lot of shows and commentary on national security, on global affairs and that kind of stuff. And just lend like, here's the no shit truth of what's going on, why it's going on, what the impact is on everyone. So the problem was, is it was 2016 and you had an election going on and the world started to get more political than I feel like it's ever been more divided than it's ever been. And if you didn't talk about Trump or Hillary that year, no one, you could literally be like, here's how you cure cancer and end all terrorism forever. And people would be like, yeah, get out of the way. Hold on. What's going on with this, uh, with this election. Like that, that's all that mattered. What's going on with the emails? What's going on with whatever? Yeah. So it was like, all right. So we kind of pivoted. I would do some more hits on, you know, politics and stuff like that. And then started my own show, which gradually also became more political in nature, which news, but you know, everything's political these days. So, um, kind of just ended up doing that and had one show. I had a show that was on blaze, um, first with CRTV and then we merged blaze and CRTV and, um, it just kind of stuck. And then all of a sudden here we are. And that's what I do for a living. Uh, which again, I never anticipated. I hate talking politics. Yeah. Um, I never trained or studied for any of this, but I've, you know, we've got teams and producers and broadcast switchers and cameras and all sorts of shit. Now and we do that and we'll, you know, we'll produce some stuff for other people as well. And it's fun. I enjoy it, but it's also taxing. Yeah. Where do you record out of? So we're out of the Jacksonville area. So, um, you know, and then we've got some people who are there and some people who are remote. Um, you know, the, the, the saving grace with some of the, the COVID bullshit and, and just the, the way that the world changed during that, moreover, I should say, is, you know, there's tools now where, you know, I've, my, my one producer technically directs the show on the other side of the country, yeah, that's you awesome. know, he connects to the studio and runs all the stuff. I can see it. Yeah. He's not there, but he's, you know, yeah. so, um, so yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's working on that and really, you know, we're going to do some other projects moving forward that focus on people who served and stuff like that. Cause I want to give back, I want to bring attention to that. And I think it's way more important than the stuff that we talk about on a daily basis, which is not to rip my own show, but, um, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of shitty stuff going on in the world and it's frustrating that the only thing, you know, it seems like people will be like, Oh, you're just out there fear mongering and, you know, trying to scare people and this, that. I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm just shooting you straight telling you we've got some issues. Yeah. I'm not saying that we can't fix said issues, but I don't think anyone thinks things are rosy. So talking about that stuff, you know, you asked earlier, you know, what's your first part of the day and you kind of wake up, you get that coffee and you just get punched in the nuts with the headlines, you're like, yeah. shit, yeah. like, here we go again. Here we go again. Like, I remember really having a different thought of this country when I was back doing yeah. this stuff. And now things have changed so much. And it's like, man, I, I'm, you, you kind of get confused sometimes, like yeah. on where you stand on certain things, where you stand on what you did and not 
precisely what you did or who you did it with, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's, it's like, yeah, no, I know what you mean for sure. Um, so what, uh, moving forward, what, where do you want to take, uh, take it? Like what, uh, well, I, my plan for right now is to keep the show. You know, this is my show with Drew Berquist and we used to, we used to do more guests. We used to do a lot of guests actually. Um, and we still will periodic, but, but keep that as just like, Hey, here's my commentary. There's going to be, you know, this, I mean, there's going to be haters. There's people I get hilariously awful messages all the time. You know, you get death threats all the time just because this world's so divided. There's no, everyone lives in these absolutes. Yeah. It's all black and white. It's like, no, no, no folks. Like, I, like, here's the deal. I love this. So I want to, for now, the plan is, is to keep that we've gotten beat up big time by, you know, the big tech platforms that are out there. Cause you know, they disagree with viewpoints that I have, which I don't think are overly extreme, but they, you know, I'm on, I'm on a different side than they are. So we've gone from, you know, with, large audiences having just great views and, and a great team to getting snuffed out by them a good bit, having to fire some people at points just to kind of adapt and, and adjust. So I, you know, it, you see that it's like, man, it beats you up. It's also like, well, I, I think we're over the target. If, if this is happening again, that's not saying that everything we do, everything I say is right. Um, but I think that there's some impact here. So all that to say, the plan is to stay with that, Try and bring a America first, not America first, the political thing, but like, hey, let's all just agree yeah. that America kicks ass. Like, you know, when you're in Afghanistan, you see the biggest issue, one of the biggest issues there is no one rallies around the flag. They're all, I'm a Hazar, I'm a Tajik, I'm a Uzbek, I'm a Pashtun. Like, or, or counterpoint, how about you just be Afghans? Yeah. Like, love your country, fight for your country. You'd, you'd be a much better stable place if that was the case now obviously that's not happened and it's not going to happen but it's sad to come back here and see that we've really kind of become our own afghanistan it's like people identify more as red or blue yeah it's it's become so tribal i think you know to try to boil it down to one one particular problem i think is that like from a, a divisive standpoint i think that a lot of people have become ingrained into the single issue voter mindset where, you know, it's like there are certain things that they, they believe in or, or they're either for or against so strongly Mm -hmm. that if anybody, whether it's a single person, individual or an entity as a corporation or whatever has the opposing viewpoint, then it's throw the baby out with the bathwater mentality. It's, it's fuck that person. I want them fired. I want them broke. I want them homeless. I hope they get fucking hit by a car. Yeah. It's like, like there, there's no middle ground, None. you know? And, and it's like, whether it's abortion or drugs or the, the border or guns or fucking, I mean, fucking pick something. It's like almost every, every one of the top 10 or 15 kind of big ticket political items are those yeah. vitriol based single, single issue voter type of, mentalities that that people just cannot fucking accept that somebody disagrees with them yeah no it's it's so it's it's fucking ruined the country it's it's, it has it's ruined the country beyond the point where i you know i say and i hope and i really do want things to get fixed but it's like we we hate each other so much in this country now i don't know that you can fix this yeah i don't it's it doesn't look good i mean to me the only the only way it gets fixed is being united through a common enemy, i.e. getting kicked in our, in our fucking teeth again. Yeah. You know, where it's, you have to, you know, like you have to basically put put everything aside and, and become united to fight whatever it is, China, Russia, fucking alien attack. I mean, right. you know, whatever. But shy of something. I mean, the aliens so, aren't coming now. They're like, you know, they're like we were going to come. Yeah, you guys yeah, are crazy. It's not, it's not worth yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's those uh, blue and green golf balls coming in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think that that's about the only the only way that that uh, that gets fixed. But um, man, I tell you, you got a fascinating fucking career and, and uh, an amazing story. One that uh, I wish you could share uh, even more of it, though. Uh, what you have shared is significant and uh, and super interesting. Is there anything else that uh, that you want to talk about or cover? Oh man, I, I now I mean I I I mean first of all, thanks. Thanks for having me on to, oh, to yeah. talk about the story and highlighting some of it. And, and thanks for all you did. And again, we got mutual friends. It's fun to finally be in the same spot as you. Yeah. Um, no, I think, you know, um, one thing I'll say is, is, you know, in addition to this is my show, and we talked a little off camera about this, you know, we're going to, and maybe I even said it during the show too. Um, we're going to try and pivot a little bit in addition to, 
you know, maybe a, maybe a bigger change will come to to focus on. I've got a couple of buddies who have who have gotten out and really kind of changed their perspective a little bit about how they help other vets or people, you know, who served and, and deployed in war zones and whatnot. Um, and not even just that. I mean, I mean, law enforcement's gotten raked through the coals now too. I mean, the the, yeah. the way that that's been treated here in America. I mean, anyone who who cares and has served and and run the opposite direction when everyone's going this way. Um, going to do a show and some content. Maybe it's not a show, maybe it's specials. I don't know, but we're going to do some stuff with that to kind of bring more awareness to that because the more I'm home and the more this country fractures and, and gets divided, the more, I think the more people are going to, to struggle with like PTSD and some of the issues that we bring home when you come home, whatever, whatever the, the triggers are for that person, whatever the, the thing is, I think one of the things that people struggle with the most, whatever their job was, and frankly, it could be, it could be an analyst who was out there who never left the base, but they're, you know, the fear and the mindset and the what ifs that have gone in the, the coming home part and, and adapting and overcoming um, is obviously one of the trickiest things for people. So you know, I, we're going to we're going to work on some things where we can talk about that and talk about how people got through that, got over that, their successes and or their failures. Um, so um, I'm excited about that. It's, it's going to be called in common um, just with the, the common denominator being serving and yeah. and then dealing with the the unceremonious, <laughs> you know, return. Yeah. So. Oh, that's awesome, man. Well, I, I look forward to uh, to you launching that, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely be on the lookout for it. Um, thank you again for taking the time to to come sit down and share your story, man. It's good to, to finally meet you, and, uh, and great to hear hear everything you had to say. Absolutely. Thanks yeah. again for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. Uh, for you guys, hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, choke yourself. Uh, and as always, the support that you guys show week after week, show after show, is nothing shy of... Uh, both humbling and uh, incredibly uh, rewarding. So thank you guys uh, truly for, for your support. Um, hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, this is Mike Drop.